As much as zombies are ubiquitous in video games these days, that really wasn't the case back in the early 2000s. Resident Evil was the big zombie game series, and maybe you could throw in the House of the Dead rail shooters too? You of course had a few licensed games here and there, taking inspiration from, or altogether adapting, a popular movie, and plenty of games that featured zombies in them, but they certainly weren't the selling point, and likely not even the main enemy type. The rare times where zombies were the main focus, the tone was mostly on the less serious end of the spectrum. 2006 saw the release of Dead Rising, and while it had a mostly campy tone, it was basically the only game back then to give players a zombie apocalypse setting that was on par with the best zombie films. When looking back, Dead Rising almost feels like an isolated incident, a happy accident if you will. Even the most recent mainline Resident Evil title, while incredible, strayed away from the series' zombie origins. As movies at the time were likely opening the floodgates in terms of new fans of the horror subgenre, there wasn't much in the way of video game releases to scratch that zombie itch. Until the fall of 2008. Dead Space launched in October of that year, and while the Necromorphs aren't the traditional humanoid zombie types, they are still undead humans, and the game's setting and tone are completely serious and played for horror. Call of Duty World at War came out the second week of November, and in it was a little side game of sorts, zombies. The premise was simple, work together with up to three friends to stay alive as long as you can, fighting off the hordes of zombies approaching your safe house. Playing cooperatively with your buddies and a modern AAA first-person shooter where you fight off zombies? Holy shit, nothing else could possibly compare. Until one week later, when Left 4 Dead released. Hello there. Valve was at the forefront of making high-quality PC games in the late 90s and early 2000s. The Half-Life series is one of the most well-regarded in the first-person shooter genre, and in all of gaming for that matter. As well, the Counter-Strike and Team Fortress games are some of the most influential multiplayer shooters, showing that Valve had a knack for crafting incredible experiences both for single-player and multiplayer. In 2006, they released their first episodic sequel to Half-Life 2, Half-Life 2 Episode 1. While a few of their PC games received ports to consoles, such as Half-Life 1 on the PS2, and the Xbox eventually getting the sequel a year after its Windows release, the Orange Box was really Valve's coming out party for the typical console gamer, offering a package so great for the price, it would be almost irresponsible to pass it up. Not only did this include the previous Half-Life 2 titles, 2 and 2 Episode 1, it came with three brand new games developed and published by Valve, Portal, Team Fortress 2, and the newest Half-Life installment, Half-Life 2 Episode 2. With this steal of a deal, five good games for the price of one, console players likely trusted that the next title that came from this company would be great. And it was. Left 4 Dead released the third week of November for the Xbox 360 and PC. It was developed by Valve and Turtle Rock Studios. The latter would be acquired by Valve and renamed Valve South before breaking off to be its own studio again not long after. Besides being a phenomenal game, which I will go very in-depth with in a moment, Left 4 Dead truly provided players at the time with something they hadn't seen before. Not only was this game multiplayer friendly, it was designed around four friends playing together. Not playing a side mode, no, the whole game, all four campaigns, together. Not simply being next to each other while you do your own thing on screen. Cooperation isn't a misused term here, it's necessary to survive. Ignoring all that for now, this was, for all intents and purposes, the first zombie apocalypse setting depicted on PC. I'd almost go as far to say it's the first on consoles as well, but I do think Dead Rising provided a decent window in which to explore that setting with its mall. Even the Resident Evil games mostly showed us big buildings with a couple zombies here and there. Absolutely no slight against those games, they're exceptional in their own ways, but if you were looking for anything akin to 28 Days Later, nothing came anywhere close until Left 4 Dead. The city, and possibly the entire world, is overrun with infected. The zombies come from anywhere and everywhere, are seemingly limitless, and are extremely quick and dangerous. It's the perfect setting for a tightly designed shooter with a heavy focus on cooperation. Tightly designed isn't some fun buzzword I decided to throw in because it makes me sound smart, either. This game, from top to bottom, is all killer, no filler. It's honestly incredible to me how well-considered this game is. Almost everything you can think of either has multiple purposes or pushes players to engage with cooperation. No matter what element you point to, you can circle back to the same question and get a satisfying answer. Does this have multiple functions? Does this encourage group strategy? 
Crouching makes your shots more accurate, but even better, your low position gives your allies a clearer shot, keeping your head out of the line of fire. The flashlight helps in dark areas, but since there's no battery meter, what's the point in being able to turn it off? Well, the witches react to the flashlight, as do the wandering infected, so being able to turn it off and on has a clear purpose. Your melee attack is very weak compared to your guns, but its main purpose is to push the zombie hordes away from you, clearing up space without putting your team in danger of shooting each other. It's also another tool for dealing with special infected, as you're able to shove a survivor who's pinned down by a smoker or hunter to grant instant freedom, a choice of helping your teammate ASAP or letting them take more damage to assure the enemy is defeated, and for the boomers, the melee push is vital when up close, so as to not have him explode all over your face. Wait. You know, fuck. We can- we, we're shoving him back and forth with- <laughs> Dude, fuck! Pills grant you temporary health, which on its face helps with not dying, of course, but it's also beneficial for when a player falls below 40 hit points and their character starts to limp. That temporary boost in HP will keep them from slowing their teammates down, thus aiding the overall goal of getting through the level as a team in one piece, and it's also a faster heal compared to the med kits, so it's easy to use when on the run. You can use the first aid kits to heal yourself, of course, but you can also heal your allies, providing an intimate moment for you and your friend to get up right next to each other and... Wow, thanks, Dorkax. This is just like consensual gay sex. Uh, moving on. The safe room doors act as the end goal for almost every level, but they're also the only doors that the infected can't break through, offering a decent quick defense if you're overwhelmed early in the level, or at the end, if you're waiting on somebody, or just want to make sure you make it out alive. Tanks can break down the start of the chapter safe room exit doors, though, so keep that in mind. The random empty closet rooms can be a temporary safe place to heal yourself, used as a defensive bunker to hole up in, and they're also the respawn location for survivors after they've died. Doors can be broken down, but they're also valid lines of defense, and shooting a hole through the middle could make climactic encounters more manageable. Since the director can spawn in zombies and special infected in nearby rooms when you aren't looking, closing an open door as you run along could very well benefit you later on. Opening doors to random rooms will slow you down, thus allowing more time for the director to build up zombie hordes behind the scenes, but those out-of-the-way rooms could house beneficial items given that they spawn in different locations each time, thus making doors and the rooms they lead to a microscopic game of risk versus reward. You can pick up and throw gas cans, propane tanks, and oxygen tanks. They can make for effective trap placements to take out a mass of zombies while conserving your ammo, but because you can't do anything else besides push zombies away with them in your hands, transporting the environmental explosive to a potentially more helpful location is a risk, so your teammates will have to protect you. Losing your HP and needing to be revived by a teammate is obviously cooperation, but the same thing goes for falling off a ledge. While you can still leap off or get smacked far over the edge, more often this is turned into a team-building exercise where an ally has to pick you back up. What's more, the time it takes to pick someone up puts that survivor in risk of falling off themselves, as all of the special infected have ways to send someone over. Smokers pull, obviously, but tanks can falcon punch, and boomers and hunters can stagger you backwards. The special infected as a whole were masterly crafted around the idea that a group of four would need to stick together to survive. Hunters and smokers debilitate their targets, so unless a different ally comes to save them, it's all but guaranteed that that survivor will die. They can be easily disposed of if it's a one-off and if the group stays with each other, but if a hunter tackles a straggler, then a smoker pulls away the helper, and if a boomer then draws the horde towards one of them, things can turn to shit really quickly. It can sometimes be difficult to get your group out of a death spiral, as when one person gets distracted or pulled away, that's one less person to help another survivor when they might need it. The best defense against losing your squad one by one is to simply never allow the first domino to fall. Always stick together, never let anyone lag behind. When a problem does arise, no one tries to play the hero, everyone pitches in. When things start to get too messy, helping a drowning survivor might result in you being pulled down with them, so at times, the best solution just may very well be to push on and cut your losses. If you don't learn this lesson early on or misjudge the danger of the situation, this can easily result in a team wipe. Like I've said before, Left 4 Dead isn't a game where you and your friends play separately, but at the same time, no, cooperation is necessary. This thought process is encapsulated quite well with the, albeit kind of unremarkable, Tank Special Infected. It being named Tank really feels like lampshading in a way, since it is really just a big brute with a bunch of health, but sometimes the simple solution is the right one. On higher difficulties especially, a tank requires everyone's undivided attention. 
They have so much health and can easily incapacitate a survivor in a moment's notice, meaning all hands on deck are necessary to take the thing down. If I really wanted to, I could probably make an argument on why the shortcuts and even ladders serve multiple functions or encourage team strategy, but I think you get the idea. Another word you could use to describe all of this is efficiency. Left 4 Dead is nothing but efficient. There aren't any wasted or even underutilized mechanics. Everything serves multiple functions or aids the teamwork mentality. The cinematic trailer doubling as the attract video when booting up the game also fits the bill of efficiency. This four-minute clip shows off the characters and their personalities, sets the tone of the game, demonstrates how important teamwork is to the overall goal, and even has a mini-arc of its own, similar to the rise and falls of tense action we'll see with each individual chapter of the game. It also shows off almost every single element you'll see in a typical Left 4 Dead match. Bill wipes off a green slime, potentially boomer bile, which would explain the hordes of zombies rushing at them in a moment. The witch enemy type itself paired with her musical cue, the fact that flashlights alert witches, that you can use doors as barricades, that smokers can grab and pull you away from the group, that you'll have to help up survivors when they get incapacitated, that you should have a Merry Christmas, that pipe bombs attract zombies before exploding, that hunters pounce on survivors, that shoving special infected off can free your teammate, that some cars have alarms which alert the horde of zombies, that tanks are a thing and can toss cars and even throw chunks of the ground, and look at that, a ledge pull up. Throughout, we can even see the survivors using a large percentage of the weapons, double pistols, shotgun, assault rifle, and SMG. The only things not featured in some way are molotovs, first aid kits, pills, and throwable gas can objects. This serving as a succinct snapshot of Left 4 Dead's gameplay is already impressive, but what's more, it leads directly into the first chapter of the No Mercy campaign. How very efficient of you, Valve. In my eyes, one of the things that really sets Left 4 Dead apart from a lot of the more modern games is the tone and the humor, and this trailer really exemplifies what I'm talking about. The zombies aren't played for laughs, the setting is taken 100% seriously. The survivors are presented with a hopeless, near-unwinnable situation, and they don't downplay it at all. They take it in while the game tells the player with its visual and audio design that, yeah, these are grim circumstances. You might not call this a horror game, but it has tension, stakes, suspense. It's at the very least horror adjacent. There's certainly not a pop song blaring in the background to make the game feel fun. Don't get me wrong, Left 4 Dead is immensely fun, but the game doesn't try to convince you of that fact. It plays its zombie apocalypse setting straight and trusts the players that they'll have a good time with the game on their own. The characters have an endearing chemistry with each other and they do joke around here and there, but the best part is that no one is trying to be Tony Stark. Bill's interaction with Francis is funny, but they aren't trying to make the fake audience laugh, or even Lewis laugh, even though he does. They're just talking to each other in a way that conveys they've already spent some time together and are closer than total strangers. Lewis freaking out about the witch could also be seen as comedy relief, but he's simply reacting to the near-death experience he's having. He's not hamming it up for the crowd. Bill's final line is my favorite of the trailer, since it's funny, but not haha -ha funny. It's dark humor, making light of their bleak outlook on survival. The situation they're in is dire, but there's a twinge of deadpan humor somewhere in there, mostly thanks to the delivery. We made it! I can't believe we made it! Son, we just crossed the street. Let's not throw a party till we're out of the city. The voice actors for all of the four survivors are solid as hell. Earl Alexander as Lewis. Sir, please, we're not infected. Jen Taylor as Zoe. Oh, nice, a cabin in the middle of nowhere. I know how this movie ends. Vince Valenzuela as Francis. Listen, Candy Pants, we can make you open that goddamn door. Can you really? And Jim French as Bill. Jim French passed away in 2017, and this might just be me being selfish, but I kind of wish he did more voice acting work. Truly, Bill was voiced to perfection. I love how well the grizzled war veteran character came through. Jim French is a legend purely going off of his work on this game. I'm certainly glad that Valve got him on board for a few of their projects. No, 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 no one gets in here until I know you're immune. Son, we're immune, we're tired, and there's infected in the damn woods. Now cut out the shit and let us in. As I mentioned earlier, the humor is definitely present in Left 4 Dead, but it feels tonally consistent with the rest of the game, and in some cases, hilarious. Some of the writing on the walls honestly made me laugh out loud, especially the We Are The Real Monsters one, and Allison's poem and the reactions to it. Even though these gags are meant to make the player laugh, these are unobtrusive and believable to me. 
If you've ever seen the weird genre of tweets where it depicts world-ending events happening while Twitter users react to it in an almost meme-y fashion, I think this is basically the same thing. The reason those tweets are so great in my eyes is because I think that's genuinely what would happen to some extent. Yeah, of course many would panic and post about doom and gloom scary shit, which we do see here as well on some walls, but you'd of course see the other side as well. People joke around and make light of every situation online, no matter how horrifying. This just feels like that, an anonymous message board of sorts for people to communicate with each other, which opens the door to people reacting the way Allison's haters did. There's no time for self-indulgence, Allison. We're in a zombie apocalypse. It's time to meme on this wall. With the dialogue, it's mostly just two characters talking with each other about their preferences or the next plan. The closest thing to annoying I ever saw was Zoe making an Aliens reference, and the reoccurring bit where Francis hates everything. I ever tell you how I feel about helicopters? <sighs> Do you hate them? I guess I did tell you. The Aliens reference felt surprisingly fine to me, and I think it's because it seemed like it was Zoe making the movie reference, not the game, and the characters even laugh when they hear it. Come at you and they never goddamn stop. Game over, man! Game over! What the hell was that? <laughs> Bill seems confused, but that would make sense since he's a bit on the older side. The Francis hating everything bit could have easily gotten stale pretty quickly, but because there's so many possible dialogue lines for so many different situations, it didn't repeat enough for me to get tired of it. I hate stairs. In fact, the slow realization that he's announced he's hated almost everything at a certain point was pretty great. I hate elevators. Seriously, this dude hates basically everything. I hate helicopters. I hate hospitals. And doctors and lawyers and cops. Okay. Francis, is there anything you don't hate? You know what I don't hate? I don't hate this. Never did the voice lines divulge into one-liner jokey jokes, and I'm thankful as hell for that. In addition to the voice lines, the other bits of audio design are arguably even more impressive. It strikes the perfect balance of completely engrossing you in the game world, while also conveying a ton of information to the player purely off of sound effects alone. One of the main goals the designers had for the music in Left 4 Dead was to make it good enough and unobtrusive enough so that players wouldn't want to turn it off. As someone who generally prefers to listen to something else while I play a game I'm already familiar with, I can't really do that here. The audio is far too important to the experience. Every special infected has their own separate audio cues for when they spawn in, when they're nearby, and for when they attack and die. Smokers will cough when present on the map, so if you hear that, you know you could get pulled away at any second. <laughs> their tongue snare has a very distinct noise to go along with it, so even if nobody gets grabbed, you know there's a smoker out there who is close enough to try. After being shot and killed, they always make this noise and produce a puff of clouds. The boomers will gurgle and groan basically all the time, so they're very easy to hear from a distance. Their puking noise is gross, as it should be, and they explode and send their juices flying when defeated. Hunters are a little more unique. They don't make their idle noise when standing, it's only when they crouch. They can't perform their pounce attack unless crouched, so once you hear their low growls, you know one is in position. I believe they have a recognizable screech in non-versus settings when the bot has a survivor in their sights before a pounce as well. Hunter! Their howls are one of the scariest and most distinctive sounds in the game, echoing off the walls the moment they leap out of a crouched position. Normally it's when a hunter is actively trying to pounce on a survivor, but in versus mode, you can spam it to distract survivors with the constant racket. Interestingly enough, apparently the hunter also makes a distinct noise when they break down a door compared to when any other zombie or infected does. Another nice audio warning for players to listen for. If you're hard of hearing, the full captions do a satisfactory job at letting the player in on important information, which was not something too common back in 2008. The three special infected have their own jingle, a musical motif unique to them that coincides with them spawning or existing on the map somewhere. If you hear a low, bumbling, stumbling type of tune on a horn or piano, there's a boomer somewhere. And 
And the same thing goes for the hunter with the three high strings or piano keys. When a horde of zombies gets spawned in, you hear a distant horn calling in the background. Then once the zombies land on screen, a boom of a bass drum hits and the music gets more frantic. The hordes cry out, and the climactic score kicks in when you activate the finale or crescendo events. The tanks have their own yells and screams, but more importantly, you'll always know when one is around once their bombastic entrance music starts playing. I found that in extremely hectic battles, such as on survival mode, the gunfire and other sounds can drown out the tank music, which is a little unfortunate. The witches also have their own specific audio cue, and they're handled more dynamically. You can hear their sobs from very far away, and that alone is pretty unnerving the first few times you hear it. This will likely make one of the survivors announce that a witch is nearby, so everyone should turn off their flashlights. Witch! Turn those flashlights off. Her music, however, is even more interesting. The closer you get to her, the louder the foreboding horror soundscape gets. <laughs> if she starts to get restless, you can hear it through her growls. And when she's completely aggroed, she wails as the piano slams the high keys frantically. Not only are these sounds important to listen for when trying to survive, it elevates these campaigns into feeling almost like a movie. Many of these setting the mood jingles you hear are what you'd expect when watching a film to keep the tense atmosphere. This makes it all the better since that's quite clearly what Valve and Turtle Rock were going for. Every campaign gets a movie poster with their own specific tagline. After you finish the finale, there's an end credits with your stats, and it even has the usual no animals or whatever were harmed during the making of this film, except it's zombies, and it's how many you all killed during this campaign. It's pretty remarkable how much they nailed every aspect of the experience. This'll be the first game, Save Dead Rising, that even comes close to feeling like the best zombie films? Screw it, give the entire presentation a horror movie vibe filled with characters that all sound like real people, a background soundtrack that slides in when needed to fit whatever mood each scene is going for, give each campaign a gimmick and a poster, roll credits, and there we go. The cherry on top of this thematic ice cream sandwich is the name they went with for the AI program that dictates the pacing of the game, the director. There's a musical director of sorts as well that's separate from this, which controls the player-specific soundscape. For example, if only one of you is close to the witch, then only that person should have her song kick in, and etc. The main director controls things on a grander scale, since they impact the entire game. It's responsible for deciding when and where to spawn a random horde of zombies, when and where to spawn in special infected, the witch and tank locations, Oh, he knocked me onto the car! The <laughs> and even if the preset healing items, throwables, and weapons will spawn in that location or not, making it look like the game is choosing where items get placed, when in reality is deciding whether or not to load them in in the first place. Quite the elegant solution. The director tool itself made the designer's jobs a lot easier, since they just tweak one part of the code and boom, there's a new take on the level. Because it's so refined, it not only streamlines the process for any new maps Valve creates, but it also helps the community creation spring to life too. I don't know the specifics of how much control the director has as the game is going on, and the fandom page didn't have as many concrete answers as I'd like, but the part that stuck out to me was the multiple different phases, which is evident after you play the game for a while. The build, the peak, and the relax. This is what I was talking about when discussing the cinematic trailer. Every chapter feels like it has an arc to it. No matter what, you're going to see the intensity ramp up due to mobs funneling in, a crescendo event taking place, or perhaps a tank and or a witch showing up. Afterwards, you're almost always afforded the chance to catch your breath, then repeat the process over until you reach the safe room. The tanks and witches have a few places they're likely to spawn, and there are enough non-scripted encounters to make it feel genuinely unique each and every time. For example, I retried No Mercy Chapter 5 on Expert many times by myself, and saw a lot of variety, even in that one minute before climbing up the ladder for the finale. Sometimes there was a tank near the ladder, sometimes it was in the hallway, and more often there wasn't one at all. 
Because the director makes every campaign playthrough a little different, we could liken this to the now-continued prevalence in procedural generation, most commonly found in roguelite games. The furthest back I can remember hearing about this idea of a game being different every time you play was on the box of Champions of Norath. But of course, Rogue is the reason why the bad and confusing genre tags of roguelite and roguelike exist in the first place. While I personally don't enjoy those types of games all that much, in Left 4 Dead, every playthrough being slightly different hits the perfect spot for me. The campaigns are roughly 30 minutes to an hour or so, and there's really not that much the game can do to completely bamboozle your run. You always have a decent chance of making it to the next safe house. Yeah, some witch and tank placements can be rough, but honestly, because there's no out-of-game progression of any kind, and because you can keep retrying from the last safe room you visited, it makes the whole experience so much smoother and far less irritating. Apparently this wasn't the case at first. Early playtesters did have to retry from the first chapter again, which to me sounds too punishing. Some will likely feel differently, but I have no problem if a game is almost unfair with its difficulty if it gives me somewhat lenient checkpoints, and not having to go back to the first stage every time you fail makes the party wipe scenarios not feel as painful. If you're going for specific achievements, your mileage may vary, of course, but the real achievements are the fun you had along the way, right? Speaking of Dead Rising earlier, there's an achievement for Zombie Genocide Ist, which requires one more kill than Dead Rising Zombie Kill achievement. Gotta love it. Purely subjective here, but I really like how Valve structured these achievements. Going solely off the percentage of players who have them, and my personal playthrough as well, there's a wide range of them that are pretty easy to get if you simply play the game for a while, there's a handful that you have to go out of your way to get, and there's another handful that are decently difficult and require a lot of time and effort to acquire. I don't know, the fact that I could see when I or other players got achievements just felt fun. Hey, good job, dude, you got the thing! Returning to the director for a moment, one of the most interesting things I read when researching this game was the difference between wandering zombies and mobs. These two are unrelated to each other in the director's eyes. One is just the zombies you find along the way that aggro when you get too close, potentially even spawning off the stage and running at you when you've been spotted, and the other is the mass of zombies that get teleported onto the map nearby to all run directly towards your party with no hesitation. Initially, when I was brainstorming about Left 4 Dead, I was fiddling with the idea that the normal zombies become so standard after a while, they more or less blend into the map itself. They're an extension of the environment, whereas the special infected are the real quote-unquote enemies of the game, the ones that behave with some form of intelligence and are given AI that can make decisions for itself. Then I thought about how little credit I was giving the common infected. Their pathfinding is very impressive, and there aren't any places where a player can stand but a zombie can't, which is smart. More importantly, they not only deal a lot of damage on high difficulties, 20 on expert per hit, but even on advanced, if you don't find a good place to hole up in a zombie storm, you could easily become surrounded and not be able to move. Besides the damage they inflict, they also slow you down tremendously. One hit, even on normal difficulty, will basically have your speed. This was implemented to make it less likely that a lone player could plow through every horde of zombies they come across when running off on their own. You're dependent on your team to help clear the mass engulfing and slowing you down. Clearly zombies are a real threat and should be respected as such. They can so easily be the difference between falling behind in a crucial moment or staying alive because you're still on pace with your team. But doesn't what I just said sound awfully familiar? They drain your movement speed and deal small bits of damage as you try to make your way through the game world? Are the regular zombies really all that different from Blight Town or the Swamp and the Valley of Defilement? Functionally? Not especially. Climbing up onto high obstacles is advantageous due to the swarming nature that is the zombie horde, almost as if they're a force of nature somewhat similar to a tidal wave of sorts. Zombies flooding your surroundings, seeping into the narrow crevices to attach onto you, submerging you down into the sea of infected flesh. It's scarier than anything you could possibly imagine. It turns this regular level into a water level. All that being said, what truly swayed my opinion on this thought experiment was the enlightenment I gained when researching about the director. No, these zombies aren't the enemies, the special infected aren't the enemies. Truly, the main antagonist is the director itself. When I play a game of Left 4 Dead now, the language I use when thinking and strategizing have changed from what I used previously. No longer is it, will there be a tank up ahead, or I hope there's not a smoker nearby. It's, I hope the director hasn't spawned a smoker up ahead, or why the fuck did the director place the witch right in front of the only door out of this place? What an asshole. 
Yes, the tools at which the director uses to challenge us are what's dealing the damage, but that's like saying the burglar didn't stab the person, the knife did. The director is our adversary here, and I think that's pretty neat. The guns are split into two tiers, pistol, pump shotgun, SMG, hunting rifle, assault rifle, auto shotgun. Looking at them on a macro scale, even though the tier 2 guns are objectively better than tier 1, because Left 4 Dead is a series of self-contained campaigns, nothing ever gets tossed aside. In an alternate realities iteration of Left 4 Dead, where this is all one long story mode, the moment you grab that better rifle, why would you ever think to grab an SMG again? Even in a game like Battlefront 2 Classic, once you obtain the cheater pistol through the medals on your account, why would you ever go back to the worst variation? No, it's only because these smaller repeated campaigns exist and function like they do that nothing gets neglected or thrown into a ditch. It circles back to the efficiency talking point. Yeah, you do get a sense of progression when you get the better guns, and it does function as a quasi-reward of sorts, but I just love how the starting weapons aren't abhorrent by any means, and that they're always something you'll be seeing in every single playthrough. I can so easily imagine a worse version of Left 4 Dead, where some stupid out-of-game progression dictates what weapons and throwables you start off with. Yeah man, can't wait to unlock the sniper or the grenade launcher or whatever. Also, I'm not referring to anything specific. If Back 4 Blood does do this, that's hilarious, but I have not and will not look anything up about that game. For now, at least. The weapons all pack a punch. It's very clear when you've hit a target or fired your gun in the first place since they light up the room and are loud as shit. There's something about the way the zombies sometimes drop the moment you deal a killing blow that just feels so satisfying. It's weird how this is like the exact opposite appraisal as my Earth Defense Force videos, but perhaps this comes down to state changes and expectations. A zombie sprinting, then dropping dead the moment you fire at them feels great, as does blasting a mostly stationary bug miles away with a rocket launcher. Depending on the type of gun, enemy type, and distance, the zombies can be sent flying at times, but more often I see them mostly collapsing and piling up on each other, which gives a real visceral feeling to the act of mowing down a horde. Their limbs being blown off and etc. is also nice, nothing too ridiculous, but just enough to look impactful. There's a ludicrous amount of death animations, and that's due to the designers hiring a professional stuntman to mocap hundreds of different dying motions. They took into account being shot by different guns, and even from different directions. The way the wandering infected all exist in the environment without being aggro to the player is also really creepy and makes it feel all the more believable. They hold onto themselves, stare off into walls, sit on the floor doing nothing, throw up on the ground, scratch their head. It's really great stuff. In terms of the individual guns and weaponry, I think both iterations of the shotgun are the most interesting. With the pump variation, you can melee attack the moment after you fire to cut down on the time between shots. At first, when I saw someone do this, I thought it was some glitch or something, or at the very least, some high-level skill move. Nah, it's fairly simple. I've seen someone online say that it better directs the shots to reduce spread for long distances. I can't say I for sure saw the results of that when testing on the walls, but against faraway enemies, yeah, I can kind of see it. For both shotguns, constantly reloading before they empty seems to be the best strategy here. If you expend all your ammo, there's an extra animation before being able to fire again, Whereas if you do it incrementally, it saves time overall, and you'll then ideally never have to reload all 8 or 10 shells. The sniper scope is nice, and I do like that it's a tier 2 weapon, so you can't start with a scoped rifle right away. Double pistols are also a great option, and sometimes it balances out your other gun quite well, like being the more accurate choice over the shotgun. For your other equipment, I like that the medkits don't have an absolute heal amount. Instead, it gives back 80% of the health you're currently missing. This means you jump from low HP to high HP with one usage, but it also means you can never get back to 100 health, meaning it's always better to save them for when you really need it. Unless you have an extra, I suppose, and it'd be a waste not to. The long window of vulnerability when using a medkit makes it a risk when you're not in a completely safe area, further encouraging a teammate to watch your back. It's also neat that if you heal in a dark room, you'll get a spotlight on your character. I've already talked about the pills and how smart of an idea they were, but the one thing I'll say about the throwables is how incongruent the pipe bomb behaves. When you trigger a car alarm, the zombies don't go attacking the car, they come for you. When you activate a crescendo or panic event, the zombies go for you, not the source of the sound, which is sometimes still making noise. I obviously like the pipe bomb quite a lot, so I'm happy it functions like it does, but if anything, it would make more sense if car alarms drew zombies towards them instead of you. 
It would be one less hazard on the map, but considering that they seem to stay in fixed positions, I'm not as fond of them as I want to be. For example, the first chapter of No Mercy will always have this car in this spot that has an alarm, and for the second chapter, it's this one. It'd be more interesting if the cars that have alarms were randomized to some extent. The metal detector in dead air is obviously always going to be there, but that seems like a fair concession to make, since that's really the only spot you'd expect a metal detector. I know I'm spending a lot of time discussing the car alarms, considering how infrequently they come into play, but with how much they go against the pipe bomb logic, and how static they are, if I had to pick out anything about this game that I don't absolutely love, it's this. It makes sense that zombies shouldn't be able to trigger the alarms, but one time a tank chose that car to use as a weapon, and I think it would have been chaotic and kind of fun if the tank did end up triggering the horde to come attack us with his punch. Oh well. All of the equipment you grab, be it throwables, guns, medkits, and pills, show up on your character's model. Immersion is both a big and also not big part of this game. The sound design, tense atmosphere, high stakes, and believable world building makes it easy to get engrossed in the gameplay, but it's also easy to ignore the ways in which Left 4 Dead isn't trying to hide the fact that it's a game. Even when we disregard the online setting, you still get told who killed a special infected on screen, you see outlines around the survivors when they're obstructed, even seeing the red outline of the enemy that has them trapped, and achievements also show up on the side when you've unlocked them. If you don't have them turned off, you may also get pop-up hints about what to do and what not to do. Your mileage may vary, but because it's so consistent, and the campaigns feel more or less like bot-infested multiplayer matches anyway, none of this takes me out of the moment at all. The outlines around the survivors specifically makes things a lot clearer than it would be otherwise, which I think is more important in this instance than trying to get the player to see exactly what their character would see. That being said, I still really like the effort to place the items on each survivor. It's just a nice thing that I like. The survivors calling out when they see an item or grab it is great for a lot of reasons that I'll put up on screen, but honestly, I just love hearing Lewis say he's grabbing pills. Grabbing pills. Some of those reasons are also why survivors announcing the presence of a special infected or the current status of one of their teammates is also a net positive, which I'll show on the screen again. The medkit animation appearing to have the survivor genuinely patch up their arms and legs is also a nice touch, lending good reason as to why it takes so long to do. Some of the Crescendo event interactables don't do as good a job, but I don't really care about that to be honest. Although all of the special infected help kill off the group of survivors in their own ways, to me, the smokers are the scariest of the bunch. Even though tanks are brutal on higher difficulties, you'll usually have everyone on board when taking them on, and Molotovs make it mostly a waiting game anyway. Which is you can sneak by or crown yourself once you get good enough, the hunters are dangerous, but you can utilize the shotgun melee combo to stun them if you miss a skeet shot, making them not as much of a threat if you're not in versus mode. Boomers can be annoying if they somehow sneak up on you, but they're so loud, basically die in a single shot, and need to get very close to do anything. The smoker is what truly haunts my nightmares. When a hunter traps you, you're in that same spot. If a smoker nabs you with his tongue, the distance between you and salvation gets stretched further and further. On Expert especially, if you get grabbed by a smoker and your teammates aren't literally right next to you, you could easily get incapacitated due to how hard they hit once you're all the way in. They can also pull you out of windows and off ledges, which is just cruel. Remember when I talked about how I could argue that ladders encourage teamwork and or have multiple uses? Well, apparently peeking your head above ground isn't a smart thing to do when you're the first one up the ladder. This first up the ladder ordeal was apparently something the developers noticed when groups would playtest this campaign. If everyone was at full health and doing fine, they would fly up no problem, but if some were injured, they would talk it out and usually make the player with the most health go first. Their reasoning being that they can take more damage from infected, but for me, it really is all about the smoker and their deadly tongue. The smokers aren't as bad when you play with a good group of players, but the bots are truly awful when it comes to knowing what to do in these scenarios. I've heard online somewhere that Valve and Turtle Rock intentionally made the bots play subpar so that players will always want real people on their team, and I get it, but I also think they went too far in some cases. From what I gathered when playing and reading what others have said online, bots are better than horrible players, but are so much worse than good players. They don't friendly fire you at all, which is nice, they take down common wandering infected decently, and they definitely always stay by your side, for the most part anyway. It certainly feels like they go the long way around whenever they can, 
meaning if you jumped down somewhere and got grabbed by an enemy, you could be stuck there for a while. An irritating inconvenience on normal, but almost a guaranteed failure on advanced or expert. Their priorities are also out of whack. They often go for downed survivors instead of helping someone who is trapped by a hunter or smoker, and even ignore someone on a ledge in favor of someone being attacked by a tank? They sometimes just don't know what they should be doing at all and stand there for a bit before helping out, and it seems like sometimes their priorities conflict or something when two people are in need of help. Just watch this mess of a shit show. Yeah, don't help me up with the time you had. Absolutely, yeah. They aggro the witch fairly often, and for some reason barely even start shooting at her until she's knocked down the aggressor teammate? They don't take no for an answer when your health is low, they will use their medkit on you once they catch up, and they don't handle pills correctly at all, at least going off the little knowledge I have of the game. They'll shoot the tank even though it's already in its death animation, and they'll shoot at a horde of zombies even if they're clearly all about to die from a pipe bomb, both of those situations wasting their ammo. They can't utilize or even pick up throwables at all, which is kind of annoying since you basically are encouraged to just chuck every pipe bomb you find at that point. They rarely crouch, meaning it's tough to help them take down hordes of zombies since they're constantly getting in your way, and the worst part, for me, is they both never leave your side, but also never come close enough. When I don't want them near me, like when the tank is about to burst out of the train car in Sacrifice, they're like glue. When I want them to fall back to a safe area with me so we can all utilize the obvious choke point, they stand just outside and tank all the damage. Again, this definitely does make me want to play with other people, but at the same time, like, god damn, it's rough. In fact, after having played more of Single Player Left 4 Dead 1 since my initial video, I've come up with a new way of thinking about it. When going solo, especially on some of the mod campaigns where the terrain isn't as straightforward, you're sort of forced into paying an AI tax. Sure, you can play the game with all CPU teammates, but sometimes the price for that is one or two instances of you getting grabbed by a special infected and incapacitated. This results in you using a medkit to heal yourself, and there you go, it was time to pay up, I guess. Your AI taxes were due. I've since played a lot of Left 4 Dead 2, naturally, and with the Better Bots Workshop mod installed, it's a night and day shift. Sure, smokers are still their bane, but coming back to this game after having gotten accustomed to the Left 4 Dead 2 AI teammates? Jesus, these ones stand out. They're outright terrible. Playing with a friend group is the ideal, and where the most fun is, but when your buds aren't available, the public lobbies are what you get, and it's a pretty mixed bag. I'm sorry, but I'm not a huge fan of seeing hentai slapped on walls everywhere I go. It's also kind of difficult to know what strategy the other players want to go with, and I can never tell when I should be the one waiting for the others to lead, or if I should get things moving since they're waiting on me. Some players handle this just fine with their messages, but often I felt like I was either falling behind or rushing forward. Neither are optimal depending on the group, and you may very well see everyone nope out of your lobby because of it, or kick you if they have the votes. In terms of the four difficulties, I think Advanced is almost the perfect challenge for me. The bots are a little too stupid to do it solo, but with a friend or two, Advanced is just the proper amount of punishment to go with my skill level. Expert is a good time when you get good enough, and especially when you have a trustworthy squad of four. Zombies dealing so much damage really forces you to coordinate well through the whole campaign. You can solo if you want to. You can leave your friends behind. But when the tank spawns and if the mob spawns, well, there's no success this time. Uh, if I'm playing alone though, I kind of wish I could just keep it on normal, since I like how simple and enjoyable that feels for the majority of it, but the tanks are just way too easy. They have so little health, we can basically shoot them for a few seconds straight and then they're dead. It's extremely underwhelming, to be honest. I'll talk a bit about Left 4 Dead 2 at the end, and of course it will get its own dedicated video at some point in the future, but normal felt more challenging there, which I appreciated. Versus mode as a whole is pretty enjoyable all things considered. I only have two small issues, the first being that you can hit teammates as special infected. The developer commentary mentioned they had to remove the mechanic where survivors could shove each other, since veterans could grief newbies by pushing them off ledges. None such safeguard exists for the special infected. If players want to be assholes, they can smack you off a building. I get that friendly fire being possible gives the special infected a disadvantage, which is probably for the best in terms of overall balancing, 
but the griefing potential is still annoying. My other quibble is that you can't play this offline without modding the game in some way, which is a shame, since playing as the Special Infected is a great time, and you may not always want to deal with the veterans in public lobbies. RIP. Looking past those two molehills, when everyone's having a good time and is mostly around the same skill level, Versus mode is an absolute blast. Being able to work in tandem with your teammates is so gratifying, especially when the Smoker and Hunter work together. Even though it's satisfying as all hell when it goes your way, the times where the tank can use cars to instantly in-cap survivors feels a bit overpowered. You could easily blame the team, though, for their poor decision-making when choosing a locale to fight the tank in. The scoring system and overall goal of Versus mode is really great, and this basically aligns with something I mentioned in my Dying Light video. I personally really didn't like the invasion mechanic, since it thrusted a half-hour multiplayer match onto a player when they may not have wanted one at that time. That game seems like it is going for a more immersive experience, so the day changing to night on some settings, the balancing being completely out of whack due to the variables in player level and equipment, and even team size, and human players able to cheat, essentially, completely kills the mood for me. Again, great that you can turn that off, which I always did when I wanted to have a good time, but the reason this relates to Left 4 Dead is that Versus Mode both is the same game and is something you choose to play. If you, say, chose an offline campaign and other players could invade and play as the Special Infected, yeah, that would be kinda silly, but this is its own separate mode to pick. The best part is that you're playing the same game, you have the same goal when you're the survivors. Get to the next safe house alive. That's what you do when you play a campaign with bots, that's what you do when you play a campaign with humans, that's what you do when you play versus mode. Comparing the two teams' runs based solely on how well they did on each chapter, either distance-based if they all die, or health-based if they succeed, is the best way to go about it. It's literally testing and evaluating them on the mechanics and strategies they'll have already been employing during non-versus campaign runs. It works so well and is so smooth of a transition that you could easily theorize that the versus mode was what came first, then the campaign afterwards. That was my suspicion anyway, so I wasn't super surprised when I heard that confirmed in the developer commentary. Yes, that was the order of events. The versus mode at one point was the default and only game mode. Like I said, it would be a little better if there were settings where you could practice playing as the infected on your own offline, since that's the only missing piece of the puzzle here, but that's really the only issue I have. We could hearken all of this back to efficiency once more. These four original campaigns and two additional DLC ones got so much mileage due to it being the setting for every game type available. The AI director making every run feel different did so much for the longevity of this game, truly. The designers mentioned that due to the variety the AI director brought to the table, they never got tired of playing their game even after three years, and I believe it. The survival mode is basically the finale and crescendo events, but it keeps going. There's a bronze, silver, and gold medal for 4 minutes, 7 minutes, and 10 minutes survived, respectively. There seems to be a lax in restrictions for the special infected here, as multiple smokers and hunters can be spawned at a time, which causes absolute mayhem. Three smoker pulls at once, good lord. Welcome to my nightmare. You can play a ton of different maps that were present in the main campaigns, but there's also a lighthouse last stand setting, which is unique to this game mode. It is pretty fun, but the trek from the bottom starting position to the top is crazy nerve-wracking, given that the game spawns in hordes almost right away. Unlike Versus Mode, you can play this one without anyone joining your lobby, so it is possible to go solo with bots. I almost got silver with them one time, but that was about it. If they could rescue you from smokers or hunters in a timely fashion, maybe, but because they can't, it's basically a death sentence. In fact, at one point, the tank was even more helpful, since he ran over and freed me from my trapped position. Can't believe I can more reliably trust the tank to rescue me in these scenarios. The game originally launched with four campaigns, those being No Mercy, Death Toll, Dead Air, and Blood Harvest. When first announcing Left 4 Dead 2, many fans were skeptical of a new game releasing so soon, and considering this is an online-focused game, the community was worried the player base would be splintered, or the first game forgotten about. Valve seemed committed to not letting the first game fade away so quickly, adding in a new campaign, Crash Course, which bridged the gap between No Mercy and Death Toll. No Mercy ends with a helicopter rescue, Crash Course begins with a helicopter crash, it ends with a truck escape, and Death Toll begins on a road that has its bridge destroyed. The continuity of the story backdrop isn't hugely important, but it is kind of neat to tie these events together somewhat. 
This DLC released a month and a half or so before Left 4 Dead 2 came out. About a year later, Valve released another DLC campaign, The Sacrifice, for both iterations of Left 4 Dead. It was originally meant to be exclusive to the first game, but given that everything else made its way into the sequel eventually, it makes sense for it to be in both games. It's a nice send-off, serving as the prequel to a DLC campaign in Left 4 Dead 2 called The Passing, where the new survivors meet up with three of the original survivors. The canon here is that Bill sacrificed himself, restarting the generator so the others could make it out on the boat alive. It makes it all the more heartbreaking, since out of the four of them, Bill was the most excited about the boat idea, living on an island, teaching Lewis how to fish. Sad stuff. Even though development for the first title didn't last as long as some players would have preferred, the fact that they did end up releasing more content for the game, even after the sequel came out, is very nice. I think pretty highly of Valve, even if I don't enjoy all of their games as much as others do. I wish more studios would support their games in this way, and also be as open to the community and mods as they clearly are. All of the post-launch content for Left 4 Dead was free, except on the Xbox 360, where the Crash Course and Sacrifice campaigns went for 560 Microsoft points, 7 bucks or so. Add on the fact that they have to pay to play online. Great stuff. Thanks, Microsoft. At least they got the survival mode for free, I guess. I'm not sure why I'm saying they. I bought this shit when I was younger. Gee, thanks, Microsoft, you fucks. PC players also get the benefit of being able to play the community-made maps. Even though they aren't quite as good as the official Left 4 Dead campaigns, they're different enough to make it feel like you're playing something fresh and distinct, which is all you can really ask for. I feel weird talking about mod campaigns, since it clearly doesn't say anything about the official game or the decisions made by the designers, but what the heck, I'll give it a try. The few of them that I'll be talking about are Dead City, Night Terror, Heaven Can Wait, and Death Aboard. Dead City had some things going for it, and some things going against it. The levels overall felt too long, I'd often feel fatigued when I got to the safe room. The early stages especially just drag on and on. I also didn't really get a sense of progress, it was like we were walking through a maze of fences, offices, and alleys, all of which being within eyesight of where we just came from. The right way to go often felt random and disconnected, with no real driving force behind our decisions, like going up the elevator for a long time, only to go all the way back down through the many holes in the office floors. The urban environments are normally my favorite settings for campaigns, but because there was a lack of neon signs and other fun light sources, it felt very homogenous. That said, it did give the impression that this was a dead city, which was its goal, so I can't be too upset about it. At one point, you get to drive a tank, kinda, which was cool. The finale was very confusing, however. I punched a ticket, I guess, then we had to hold out for the subway car, except because dialogue specific for this campaign can't exist, and prompts didn't tell me what was going on, I really had no idea what we were supposed to do. I saw some train cars go by as the tanks and hordes of zombies were spawning and was very confused. In the end, it worked, I guess, even if I had to kill Lewis for the train to start moving. I don't know how much control community members have over the director and their spawn points, but there were some issues. The three basic special infected kept spawning together, side by side practically, almost always in the same location. It felt really weird and didn't give them enough room to operate. Likewise, the reason my buddy and I quit out of this one in co-op was because the spawning of the zombies in the parking garage was out of control. They wouldn't stop, and we could even see them teleport in one by one. Perhaps this could be chalked up to the modded server we were on, since it did increase horde sizes. That was actually the most frustrating part of playing community maps, the mod servers. With official campaigns, hosting a local server was fine, but we couldn't do a local server for the add-on campaigns. I looked it up after we were done, and it might have something to do with our mods not being compatible with each other's. Either way, I think it's incredibly dumb how the official servers aren't always an option, even when you're playing Versus or online campaign. I don't want to play the game with your wacky rules, dude, I'm sorry. This is why I had to give Night Terror a shot by myself, since the only server we could manage with this one gave the tanks a ridiculous amount of health and added a bunch of text on screen. And removed gunshot noises entirely. I do think the guns are normally a bit too loud, but this is going overboard. Night Terror is a pretty good time, though. It's essentially a haunted house, well, until later on where it completely changes what it is. The worst part of this campaign was easily the trick elevator, since it takes a ludicrously long time to activate and do its thing. The best part, hands down, was the Moria level. 
This is literally Moria from Fellowship of the Ring. You do have to hold E far too long on the book to proceed, but beyond that, this level is fantastic. The tanks and zombies rushing at you when you cross the bridge at the end was funny, but honestly, the stairs to get down there looked so pretty. I also liked the jungle level afterwards, where there are traps that can instantly incapacitate you. Good stuff. Heaven Can Wait was, in a way, infuriating. This took me an hour and a half, and I didn't even manage to finish it. The ending was so annoying, I just stopped when failing right at the end. The biggest thing this campaign had going against it, by far, was the lack of clarity in terms of where to go. Normally, developers use light sources to signal where the next area is, but holy moly, there were so many instances of me being lost or turned around, only to realize that the right way was just a random door or a ladder I couldn't see. This one at the end in the finale chapter was the worst. This barely visible, tucked away set of stairs is vital to progress through the level. The settings themselves were all fairly decent. I quite liked the city streets with the single-family homes, and the graveyard was the highlight of the whole campaign for me. I used a Molotov on a witch in here as a horde was charging in, and oh man, did that complete the mood. There's really only one graveyard location in the base game, and you aren't in it much. You run past it for the church crescendo event. Having to exist here for a while was great. Using a grave tomb thing to create a choke point was the most fun I had during Heaven Can Wait. Death Aboard is probably the best of the bunch. The chapters were all a decent length, the gimmicks were all unique and believable, and the setting was very interesting. The ship itself being tilted made it feel very different from anything else I had played. That chapter, however, was made a little worse since the zombies couldn't stay on the map after death, they vanished almost immediately. I also had a strange audio issue where every time my buddy shot, it was like thunder. I totally get it if this is supposed to represent your bullets impacting a steel hollow interior, but the inconsistency of the sound threw me off. I even went back again for this combo video to see if it triggered, and it didn't. The escape vehicle being a hot air balloon was also kind of funny, and even though the finale map felt way too big, the trek back down to get to the balloon was properly nerve-wracking as a result. One of the things I really liked about Dead City and Death Aboard was how they handled the car alarms. Both of them being new settings, of course, means you don't know where the alarmed cars will be, but even still, the placements of them were pretty clever. In Dead City, there's one at the end of this corridor here, which seems like bait almost, since you'll likely shoot that direction before hearing the chirp of the alarm. My mic volume unfortunately gets overshadowed by the extremely loud game, but here is my reaction to it, which was essentially immediate approval. Oh, shit. Oh, son of That's a good place for a the one in Death Aboard was much funnier, however. Have a listen. Yeah, definitely didn't expect a car to come barreling at me. Fun times. Heaven Can Wait also had a decent car alarm set piece, with the parking garage filled with them. They seemed to echo off the structure and go for a very long time. It was neat. I know none of this is super worthwhile analysis, but I felt it would be fun to include a slice of the community in here as well, since it's such a big part of Left 4 Dead. All of this being said, there's a question you may be asking, or about to, or already have typed in the comments. Why play Left 4 Dead 1 if Left 4 Dead 2 is far more populated with players, has all of the campaigns from the first game, and hosts a ton of new weapons, mechanics, modes, and even enemies? The biggest changes, from my point of view, come from the addition of melee weapons and the new special infected guns, upgrades, and throwables along the way. This isn't me picking a favorite, by the way. I'm not here to preach about why Left 4 Dead 1 is the best and Left 4 Dead 2 is way worse or anything, but there are things to consider. The mood of the campaigns in the sequel does feel a bit lighter. Most notably, the music all around has a more southerny twang to it, and daytime is a thing which obviously makes certain areas not feel quite as scary. However, none of that really factors into this discussion, since the original game's music, with the piano and horned instruments, are what plays when you pick the first game's campaigns. When strictly looking at the levels that are in both titles, the biggest factors are the gameplay changes. Without rebalancing things by including more survivors at once, you really can't keep the boomer, hunter, and smoker as present as before. The spitter, charger, and jockey add to the pool of special infected the director can pick from, and even though they do encourage teamwork and punish solo play in their own ways, 
they aren't as elegant as the original three. In the first game, the only special infected available will naturally synergize with each other quite well, so no matter what, you'll always be facing a trio that makes each other better. That isn't always the case when there are six special infected to pull from. It does open the door to more varied and potentially even more interesting 1-2 combos, but preferring the simplified roster of Boomer, Hunter, and Smoker, I think, makes sense enough on its own. I know most people really like the melee weapons and new guns, and don't get me wrong, they're fun to use, but I can't help but feel that they take away from the perfect efficiency Left 4 Dead 1 had going for it, and the teamwork element in a way as well. Instead of one sidearm, two starting guns, and three tier 2 guns, there's, like, so much more to pick from. Variety does have its drawbacks, and in terms of weapon selection, I don't think it's as balanced as before. In fact, because the game has so many different selections to throw at the player, the maps nearly resemble a zombie-killing playground. Everywhere you look, there's a new powerful gun. It sometimes felt like you weren't necessarily trying to survive, but getting new toys to play with. Again, I'm not wholesale criticizing this, but I do think the first game did more with less. As much as I initially wanted to disavow the melee weapons, since they sometimes make mobs of zombies trivial to deal with, it does seem like in certain climactic moments, the mobs were increased drastically to balance that out. When not in a crescendo or panic event, however, it is a little too simple. In Left 4 Dead 1, you had to shove back the horde surrounding you, either shooting when you cleared space, or rely on your allies to take out the zombies for you. Don't get me wrong, smacking them in the face with a shovel, or grinding the swarm to liquid as they charge at your chainsaw is definitely fun, but at the very least, some of the tension is lost with the melee weapon edition. All of this is why some people may prefer the first Left 4 Dead over the second. Shiny new things are nice, but the simple efficiency of the first game is alluring in its own way. Maybe you might disagree, and that's fine, but in the end, I think we can all agree that both Left 4 Dead games are great and well worth playing even to this day. As silly as it may sound, I could honestly play the Left 4 Dead campaigns over and over again with friends or even with bots if I have to and have a great freaking time. The presentation is always top-notch, the characters are enjoyable to listen to, the gameplay is solid all around, the AI director makes every playthrough feel different enough to not get stale, and the mechanics all feed into each other with almost nothing being underutilized. It's so good. Truly a masterpiece of a game. I definitely didn't think I'd be calling this game a masterpiece when I started this script, but playing it again after all of these years, and especially with an extra decade plus of gaming experience under my belt, I can now so easily see how close to perfection Left 4 Dead is and was. If you're too young to remember when the game came out and are quick to lump this in with the plethora of other zombie shooters, truly, take a few minutes to research for yourself what the gaming landscape was like back in the mid-2000s. Left 4 Dead was a godsend to so many that were asking for a zombie apocalypse game, especially the people who were playing on PC. I can't imagine the joy of someone who loved Half-Life and Team Fortress, loved zombies and horror media, just binged the orange box, then has this golden god of a game release in 2008. What a time to be alive. Or undead. Is that a, is, is that a clever thing to say at the end of the, oh, whatever, I'm, I'm done. Left 4 Dead 2 is a perfect sequel to a perfect game, but is that a good thing? As much as I like what Left 4 Dead 2 has become, it's hard to deny the fact that there's really no reason to go back to play Left 4 Dead 1 at this point. This isn't because the new special infected are so great that you can't live without them, or that the absence of melee weapons, the many added guns, and even alternative equipment options makes the old gameplay feel hollow or something. No, none of that new stuff even matters to this discussion. Something I didn't realize before, which some commenters made me aware of and I've now seen for myself, you can literally play Left 4 Dead 1 inside of Left 4 Dead 2. The characters, sound design, and maps, of course, but even the smaller roster of Special Infected, and the old weapon and equipment choices. The only major differences between the mutation and the original game, at least that I could spot, involve the updates Valve made to the physics, visual effects, and programming for the sequel. Because it's running on the Left 4 Dead 2 machine, the retro gameplay of the Left 4 Dead 1 mutation gets the benefit of pipe bombs actually causing a ragdoll zombie corpse explosion, something Valve said they couldn't do in the first game and had to just add a red mist effect instead, 
and the added detail of your attacks physically affecting the zombies, such as chunks of them getting shot off with shotgun blasts and their guts pouring out sometimes, and so on. In addition to both of those, because Valve altered how they spawn in items and weapons, making them an interchangeable thing, it seems that guns can appear in more locations in the mutation than in the first game. I'm almost positive this is the case anyway. No Mercy Subway always had all three in the same few spots, but in the mutation, you'll find a couple strewn around here and there. Besides all that, I mean, the UI is different, the dead air metal detector panic event isn't optional, and the shotguns behave slightly differently in relation to the reloading animation, but that's about it. So, with all that being the case, sure, there are still some differences, but most of these are minor, arguable improvements that don't really make that big of an impact. The only changes I'd consider to be significant are the weapon spawning changes and the metal detector crescendo event. I'd say the point remains mostly unchanged, unless you're specifically wanting to hang out with the player pool that stuck with the first game, or are achievement hunting, owning Left 4 Dead 2 and only Left 4 Dead 2 is the way to go from here on out. Initially, I wrote quite a few paragraphs here, which I've now cut from the video, about how this made me sad, since I like when games have their own identity. How plenty of sequels, even the most iterative ones, usually left reason to return to the original game, from single-player titles like God of War and Uncharted, to even multiplayer-focused series like Halo and Gears of War, given their story mode campaigns. I then went on to talk about how much 14 years can do for a game's image in the mind of consumers, as on release, even among fans of the first game, people were very hesitant on Valve releasing a full-priced sequel in such short order, yet now everyone loves how cheap this game is, 10 bucks full price or $2 on sale every other month, and comes with a decade's worth of content updates and a near-infinite supply of mods in the easy-to-access Steam Workshop. Now the game looks very consumer-friendly, whereas at launch, it wasn't. Afterwards, I threw out a few potential reasons on why they stopped at 2, some of them just for laughs, and others a bit more serious. However, when writing, and recording actually, annoyingly, this script, one of the lead designers of the original Left 4 Dead did an interview explaining the reasoning for Left 4 Dead 2's quick release. Essentially, the first game should have never been shipped out, it was a broken game. To quote Chet from the article, he says specifically, Left 4 Dead was such a broken thing that nobody wanted to touch it. That game iterated so quickly that if it meant breaking something horrible, where you had to load a map two or three times but you could playtest it today, we did it. That meant at some point you had to pay for that debt. There was no way you were going to support mods for Left 4 Dead in the same way we did for Left 4 Dead 2 without a big reset. When asked why this wasn't communicated clearly with the consumers, he basically explains that he'd rather people be upset with him, making the decision to launch a sequel so soon, opposed to throwing everyone who worked tirelessly to get the game out the door in the first place under the bus in the public eye. He also says the director actually gave no fucks about the players. It was a random number generator, hilariously enough. Amazing. Anyway, with that being said, it makes a lot of sense to essentially redo the game, but with a properly functioning engine, one that can support mods like Valve obviously likes doing, but also making it easier to simply make more content for the game as a whole. However, there's still something to be said about this game, Left 4 Dead 2, being the one that represents the series forever, since the coat of paint it received seems to be that of a middle sequel, yet it's what we're stuck with as the final entry. What I mean is, these characters are the ones you'll see and play as most often these days, and this game's sound design is what'll be heard. What was a fun little musical touch and a bit of variance, the New Orleans and Southern feel to the soundtrack, and the new goofier characters respectively, are permanently what is Left 4 Dead in the minds of many, and that's at the very least a little unfortunate, as I, and at least a dozen others out there, preferred the atmosphere, vibe, characters, and so on of the first game much more than those of the second, and far more of the content centers around the latter opposed to the former. Perhaps this stark difference was due to them wanting this to seem even more like a full-fledged sequel, so as to get a real engine as their foundation moving forward while providing a new-ish experience for players? Either way, there's not much else to say on that front. Here's a paradox for you. Left 4 Dead 1 is a perfect game, and Left 4 Dead 2 is the perfect sequel for it, but the qualities that make it such a great sequel are the same ones that hold it back from, in my eyes, being a perfect game. In that first video, I went on about how efficient Left 4 Dead was, how everything had either multiple purposes, or was included to further encourage working as a team. Crouching, closets, ladders, gas cans, and on and on. When I say Left 4 Dead 1 is a perfect game, know that I don't mean it in the it scores a 10 out of 10 way, more so in the Tetris is literally flawless way. 
I certainly wouldn't put Left 4 Dead up there with my top 35 or so games of all time, but like I've yammered on and on about last time, I have a sort of respect, a reverence for it that's pointless to mask. Herein lies the conundrum. Where do you go from here? How do you make a sequel to something as cohesive as Left 4 Dead 1 without losing some of that cohesiveness? Well, you can't, really. Like many sequels that attempt to create something bigger and better with the same foundation, what we're left with is change a few things here and there, and add a lot of stuff. New special infected, new weapons, new weapons, new weapons, new maps, new game modes, new characters, new equipment choices, a couple gimmicks, and so on. That incredibly focused game that I praised to the moon and back isn't so incredibly focused anymore. Setting aside how much fun I personally have with some of these new toys, enemies, and mechanics, when taking a step back, yeah, Left 4 Dead 2 simply isn't as balanced and consistent as Left 4 Dead 1 was. The more you add to a game, the less purified that vision becomes. This is why it's sometimes easier to envision a less ambitious game on a smaller scale being more theoretically perfect than one that's more ambitious or bigger as a whole. It's always tempting to add new things, because new things are fun, right? But not only can it present balancing problems, it can harm the pacing and even undermine the main appeal to a game in the first place. With all that being said, if there was ever a game to add more and more stuffing into until the seams started to burst, it's Left 4 Dead. In that first video, I also talked about how much mileage the game overall got from the AI director, the fake personality behind the RNG, how I agreed with and understood the developers when they talked about not getting bored playing their game, thanks to the many ways in which a match could be modified slightly. It kept the game from getting repetitive and stale. One of the main things I complained about, one of the only things really, were the car alarm cars, a key reason being that they're always in the same place every time. I yearned for some variety on that front. Well, now that I've played Left 4 Dead 2 quite a lot now, I see that the new weapons and equipment, among many, many other things, don't just detract from the perfect balance, it doesn't just disrupt the efficiency found in Left 4 Dead 1, it also fosters that spark of excitement once more, that every time you play, something will be a bit different. Ignoring the quality of each individual new equipment option for now, while there are definitely times where you get overwhelmed by choice, there are others where you're scrounging, desperate for something good, having to deal with whatever the game throws at you, and that can create some really enjoyable and memorable playthroughs. This is one of those times where I can see it both ways. I can absolutely appreciate starting with a normal shotgun and submachine gun in Left 4 Dead 1, and advancing to the better three guns later on as a reward, the progression is satisfying, but the times in Left 4 Dead 2 where your ammo is about to run dry, or you're so DPS starved you take any tier 2 gun the game took pity on you to spawn in, even one you normally hated? This is one of my favorite feelings in games as a whole, toughing it out with the equipment you have, trying to survive with a less than ideal set of circumstances. I love it in Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom, I love it in Death Stranding and Dying Light. When your options are limited, and you're forced to either think up a creative solution, or utilize what little you have to its fullest, it scratches that tactical part of my brain, even if I'm not necessarily required to be smart or strategic. There's something so addicting about making do with a random set of potentially discordant equipment options, and I suspect this is a big reason the roguelite genre is so popular. In Left 4 Dead 1, they basically let you take your pick out of everything in the game. Less good shotgun and machine gun versus more good shotgun and machine gun, and sometimes a hunting rifle. In Left 4 Dead 2, though, if you had the choice, every single time, of all the guns and equipment options, you likely know exactly what your loadout would look like. In many single-player games, developers sometimes have to save players from themselves, so they don't unknowingly optimize the fun out of a game, doing the easiest and most efficient thing opposed to engaging with other mechanics and ways of playing. This is the same idea, getting the player out of the mindset of never trying anything new, or never picking things even slightly unfavorable for the situation. The point is, with all of this variety, sure, at its worst, it feels like your sideshow Bob and the rakes are the never-ending supply of different weapons the game throws at you to, I don't know, try to appease the gamers who haven't seen their favorite yet. <laughs> but on the other hand, when the variety goes along with the more conservative doling out of the weapons as you explore the level, it honestly provides a more tense and satisfying experience than the first game at times. The more I play, the more I'm realizing that the simple ammunition piles are a hindrance. If you found your favorite gun already and keep coming across ammo, of course you'll choose to keep your old reliable instead of being forced to switch it up. When paired with early laser sights, ammo piles can be turned into a choice, as you might opt to stick with the less desirable option to keep the laser attachment, but on the whole, I think less ammo and more replacement guns make for a more exciting time. Finding the exact same gun you're using as a way to refill your ammo that way can be its own reward after all. It's weird since the Left 4 Dead 2 game designers feel the same way.
In the developer commentary, they said verbatim that more guns and no ammo piles caused players to switch more often, but the finales should still have them. I agree, so it's odd that I still sometimes find them when just playing the game casually. The many ways in which Valve injected more variety into the game with the weapons, item spawn changes, mutations, campaign gimmicks, special infected and equipment options is the reason this is the perfect sequel. It adds on to the only half of the appeal of the first game that you could add on to. You can't make something better than perfect, sorry Curtis Axel, only carry it along, and because the original game's core gameplay and mechanics are still here, beefing up the replayability factor makes a lot of sense, even if it can backfire at times. I'm not going to go in-depth with the primary guns in the game, for the most part. Well, I adore the new silent submachine gun, it sounds so silky smooth. Reload. But besides that, one of my favorite habitual slip-ups comes in the form of reloading too early. I'm sure we've all been there, we think we're in a calm spot and choose to reload when we really didn't need to, and shit, now I can't help out my teammate. Especially with the larger clip snipers, it really helps to steady your left index finger, resisting the urge to press the R key when you've only shot three bullets out of your 30 capacity gun. This also provides a unique strength to the shotguns, further adding reasons to pick one depending on the circumstances. Since you're adding in a shell one at a time, you aren't forced to sit through an entire animation before being able to shoot whatever available shells you have at the ready, meaning you can lend a hand in tight surprise situations. Something else I wanted to mention, as a more general praise for the game and its gunplay, is how satisfying it is to protect your teammates from zombies. Really, killing groups of zombies in any capacity feels great in these games, but I particularly love when someone gets puked on and you get to sort of outline their body, getting rid of the enemies hovering around their face. It scratches an itch akin to staying in the lines when coloring in a coloring book. Ah, this game is so much fun to play. One of the design decisions I respect the most from Valve with Left 4 Dead 2 was not stooping to the low of granting more inventory slots for each survivor. There's a few miscellaneous tools you can acquire that don't really conform to the categorization found previously. Adrenaline shots and defibrillators make enough sense to fit the temporary and permanent healing slots respectively, and the boomer bile is another throwable, so of course, but the different ammo types so easily could have found their way into an entirely new inventory space dedicated to them, but instead, at its best, it's a choice offensive or defensive. Flaming and explosive rounds pack more of a punch and can deal with certain enemy encounters better, if you save them for the right moment anyway, but you might be sacrificing a medkit, an invaluable healing tool. That's quite the risk versus reward there, but like I said, only at its best. More often, I find myself switching to the fire rounds, placing them, grabbing a clip of incendiary ammo, then carrying on with my medkit like nothing happened. At its worst, it's simply a net positive, free extra damage, and an extra clip of ammo with nothing being meaningfully thought about or sacrificed. I'm not sure if I can really blame the designers on this, I think this either-or mechanic with offensive and defensive items will always come down to how the game spawns them in and where the players are in terms of health and confidence. The explosive rounds aren't as universally beneficial as the fire rounds, but they have their uses. They can deal friendly fire damage to your allies, and yourself even, if used in tight spots, which makes them worse when used as a blanket ammo refill. The times where I've seen them come in handy the most, besides lighting up faraway groups of regular zombies, were with witches. I've tried it both on its own and in conjunction with the bile bomb, and it seems to stun her enough that she can't make an approach, so I'd say that's an edge case worth keeping in mind when you spot explosive rounds on certain maps. The fire ammo is a lot more straightforwardly helpful, especially for higher difficulties. Every single bullet will eventually kill a common infected, given that they ignite in flames, and because the enemy itself is what's on fire, not the ground, it doesn't deal damage to you or your friends. They're especially efficient when paired with guns that have a large clip, as not only are you getting a completely free ammunition cycle, every shot being a guaranteed kill on regular zombies means you can conserve your bullets even more. Lastly, yeah, they set things on fire, so they're obviously going to come in handy for tankier enemies, like witches, special infected, and, well, tanks. The designer said the initial idea was to have an extra munitions item, Basically, you'd choose between carrying ammo for when you'd need it, or a medkit. Playtesters didn't see the benefit from the additional regular ammo, and thus never chose it, so Valve made the ammo do a different thing instead. Probably for the best, but this could be why they still decided to add in ammo piles in a lot of the campaigns. The defibrillators are a good addition, if only for how certain mutations and game modes take advantage of them, such as realism, where rescue closets don't work and witches can kill you instantly. In normal gameplay, though, medkits seem to be the clear way to go, However, I have seen decent arguments online for defibs when playing versus mode, given how beneficial it is to get more people into the safe rooms. 
The adrenaline shots granting a boost in speed overall, in addition to letting you dash through clumps of infected without getting slowed down as much, and helping you complete tasks quicker to boot, like pour gasoline or help up your teammates, makes it a worthwhile choice depending on which chapter you're in or what circumstances you're facing. The way it changes the visuals and sound of the game after you've taken a dose puts it over the top for me, a very neat effect. Plus, the one-off use of proving that you're stronger than Mustachio in the Carnival campaign is just ridiculously silly in all the right ways. The boomer bile attracting a new horde of zombies instead of just the ones in the area already separated from the pipe bomb enough that even when tossing it in a corner it's distinct, but naturally its best quality is how you can use it against tanks, witches, or to simply get a wave of zombies to attack each other instead of you. It feels like a riskier pipe bomb, one that could help, or could hurt, depending on if the zombies don't get taken care of by the time the bile effect wears out. If you whiff a bile throw on a tank, for instance, those newly spawned zombies may turn their attention to you, making your situation even worse. Laser sights are a net positive for any shooter game on their own, in my opinion, but here they're even more clever, as they visibly show where your allies are aiming, thus making it easier to avoid getting hit by friendly fire. That, coupled with their rarity and lack of obsolescence, makes them one of the better rewards to stumble upon. Like I mentioned earlier, you may have to make the choice of abandoning a gun with a laser sight attached for something with more ammo in a pinch, or for something you feel is outright better, but on the whole, they're not as disposable as other equipment. I'm perfectly content with not seeing any laser sights on a playthrough, but it is pretty remarkable how well they slide into this game's already existing framework, being a clear advantage given that you can see where your teammates are about to shoot. They're so perfect, actually, that if these were a mechanic in the first game, I would have included them in my long list of reasons why Left 4 Dead is efficient and tightly designed. And to prove my point, look at that. The developer commentary confirms that they were planned for the first game, and everything I said about them were benefits they saw as well. Speaking of disposability, the chainsaw, M60, and grenade launchers are decent additions, being that they're obviously way more powerful than their contemporaries, but don't get the benefit of reloading with ammo piles. There's a degree of risk when grabbing them. They're tailor-made for certain overwhelming situations, but when their low life expectancy is inevitably used up, you're practically down a weapon slot, so maybe you'll think twice about grabbing one if your other gun isn't very versatile. The chainsaws and grenade launchers show up a lot more often than I'd like, though. The game kind of throws them at you at times, which kind of ruins their allure to some extent. I really like using the chainsaw, and love that it can basically instantly take care of a witch. Well, sometimes anyway. Oh, there's the witch! It didn't work, it didn't work, help! But finding yet another one before I'm even finished with the one I have is nuts. I'd also hazard a guess that these three weapons don't align with the new item slash weapon spawn randomness, since they're usually in the same spots. The melee weapons are interesting, as they all deal the same damage per hit, but their swing speed and how many times the game checks if you've hit something per swing will determine how good they feel to use. If you've ever grown attached to the fire axe, it being able to chop into a group of zombies as you rotate your camera is likely the reason. There's also the blunt versus sharp choice, since zombies killed with a blade will instantly fall over, essentially, so it can help when on the run, and you can slice off a smoker's tongue when timed right with a katana or something. It's rather impressive how, even though they're all similar in one regard, their swing orientations, speed, and sound effects make them all feel properly distinct. There's even multiple sounds per weapon if you check the game file. I still think they can make hordes a bit too mindless at times, but given how much more chaotic crescendo events are as a whole this time around, specifically the gauntlet types, I think it balances out in the long run. Plus, stopping to attack every zombie around you doesn't work as well with slower melee weapons. You'll usually take a hit or two at the very least, and best of all, camping in a corner can be completely undone by a spitter. It's pretty great how well the spitter works functionally, as they can both split up a slightly staggered group and deny an area for a brief time, such as a turret spot. Since we're already on the topic, the new special infected are, surprise surprise, very well crafted. The weakest of the three is probably the jockey. It certainly seems to be the one most people like the least, but even though he can be really ineffective at times and simply annoying during others, he can at least push and pull a survivor towards danger, which is a nice balance. Given that the smoker can pull and the charger can push, there being an in-betweener feels right. 
Veering off the side of a building with a survivor is always a joy, as is yoinking them behind the only bit of cover nearby, just out of the other player's line of sight. You take what you can get as a jockey. They mix well with the witches, I think, since they're so annoying and jerky you can't help but get the urge to fire at them, even when it might not be the smartest idea. I'd say the same theoretically goes for car alarms, but I personally haven't seen that strategy in action as of yet. I like how they form a tandem with regular zombie hordes. When they're the only thing coming at you, they're not too difficult to kill. They do have a bit more health than some of the other special infected, but even still, not that scary. However, their short king status means they can hide behind the taller common infected, resulting in many more surprise grabs than the alternative. It's also worth noting that they're the only special infected that you retain some control with, both as the zombie and as the survivor when they're latched on. Definitely sets them apart from the rest. The charger is very unique in that it's the only special infected whose grab can't be broken up by a shove. He needs to die if you want to save your friend. The idea that he gets stunned whenever he charges and misses is great, but when you're the special infected, it does feel like you're a victim to the level geometry a lot. Scraping the edge of a door frame or a pallet on the ground will all but assure your time as the charger was put to waste. Them being able to push players away is smart. I'm sure the designers were thinking of how many different ways they could split up a group, and they've already masterfully done pull with the smoker, the best special infected in the game in my opinion, and this is their attempt at the opposite. Even more, much like with the spitter, they do a good job of breaking a closely knit group of survivors. The spitter creates a no-no zone, and the charger can bowl into all of them, grabbing one and sending the rest flying. This makes narrow corridors a lot scarier, especially the ones that are placed near panic events, like the end of Chapter 4 in Dark Carnival. It seems like there's some behind-the-scenes work going on here, since the charger, the best special infected for this specific spot, sure does spawn a whole lot here to ruin your day. In fact, the alleyway in the parish is similar, a charger was at the end of it both times I played this with friends. Even though they're easy to avoid when out in the open, another big strength of theirs is ferrying away a survivor across the map. Smokers and jockeys pull their victim away at a reasonably slow speed, but chargers might knock you down and zoom on by until they hit something. But like I said, normally they're very, very easy to avoid, so they certainly aren't near the top of my list of worries when playing the game normally. This could be due in part to their phenomenal sound design. Their charging noise is fantastic, but it does give them away at times. You hear the incredible audio cue, and know to move in a straight line, either having eyesight on him and easily sidestepping out of the way, or you'll simply guess and get it right about half the time. That's certainly not a flaw, it's probably for the best that they have such a clear telegraph for their main attack given how impactful and damaging it is. Speaking of the sound design, Valve continues to impress with their meticulously crafted enemies when it comes to the visual and audio department. Even with three more special infected added to the roster, you can still tell them apart based on their idle noises and their own designated spawn-in musical jingle. I do wonder how much more Valve could have stretched themselves, to be honest. This is a lot to get right, and they nailed it, so I'd just be curious how many unique enemies it would take for them to start showing ambiguity in their designs, both visual and audio. The Spitter is the most interesting to me out of the three new types, the Boomer of this trio. Neither the Boomer nor the Spitter can pin down a survivor with a grab attack of some kind, they rely on more indirect methods. Both shoot out something from their mouths, and while the Boomer may cause the players to group up and protect the survivor who's being bum-rushed, the spitter tries to divide the group when possible. The name itself puts every other spitter zombie in video games to shame. This is a spitter whose goal is to split. If I was the kind of channel to make bad jokes, I may have included something like spitter, more like splitter, am I right? But I'm not that kind of channel, and I shall not make that joke. Anyway, the name works on two levels, and that's clever. Eat that, Techland, and your stupidly named floater and drowner zombies. Even as a bot, she can show off her shrewdness by trapping three members of your group while a different special infected wails away on you. It's nice to see how well these new faces can work together. Much like the boomer, she can also accelerate a bad situation, plastering spitter goo on a survivor who is already having a rough time, either currently being mauled by a different special infected, or is down and now unable to be helped without a massive chunk of damage dealt to the altruistic dummy. The fact that she, again, like the boomer, deals one last final blow when defeated is smart. 
It can be taken advantage of when playing as the Special Infected, and as the Survivor is always something to take into account. Even better, to cement her boomer cousin status, her attacks also get their own sound design warning when you're being affected by it, reminiscent of the boomer's bile puke song. I love how much my opinion of the spitter's threat level changes depending on the environment. Out in the open? Literally no chance, they're pathetic. In a narrow enclosed space? Good lord, we may be fucked. I suppose she shares that intimidation volatility with the charger. Both thrive in narrow areas and can split a team up, but when out in the open, aren't nearly as much of a hassle. I was originally going to comment on how the balance of the special infected is a bit out of whack. The boomer has a very unique strength. He doesn't pin down survivors like four of the others do, he draws a horde of zombies to the group. Going from being a third of the special infected roster to a sixth means they obviously appear far less than before. However, when going back to play the first game a bit, I'm now realizing how impactful the chargers and spitters are, as it is rather quite simple to camp in a corner when in tight situations. The spitter's acid dealing more and more damage the longer you're standing in it means you absolutely can't tank the damage, you have to move from that spot, and the charger can ram and knock everyone down. As much as I was saying the opposite in the first video, I've come around. Don't get me wrong, I don't think less of the first game, I don't think it's a problem that turtling up is so effective. There's a simple and efficient charm in Left 4 Dead 1 that I don't think will ever get washed away, but I can also admit that for what Left 4 Dead 2 aims to do, keep players on the move and never let them get too comfortable, yeah, the spitters and chargers are kind of vital for balancing reasons, especially when factoring in the new melee weapons. The boomer got a new female visual model, which is cool, but the other notable change with the zombie roster is the wandering witch. Initially, I didn't care much for these gals. Them walking around saps them of their scare factor, given that you can accidentally walk by them while barely cognizant of it at times. However, my opinion changed when I caught on to their strengths. First of all, they have their own soundscape. It's clear from a distance if the witch is stationary or not, and approaching them elicits a modified witch theme to boot. <laughs> Secondly, while, yeah, sometimes you might walk on by without trouble, or they could even walk into the fire on the map and kill themselves, funny enough. She walked in the fire on her own. There are other times you might accidentally almost run right into them. They blend in surprisingly well, and because the heightened witch track doesn't start playing until you're almost on top of her, it's very possible to be unaware of her exact location and make a mistake. That's the third reason. Them walking around means, at a distance, they kind of look like a wandering zombie. You might shoot them intentionally and not realize your error until the sound design switches. Or even better, you may shoot them without trying to. They not only get camouflaged with the surrounding environment if it's dark enough, groupings of zombies will mask her presence at times, leading to a potentially fatal shot. Fatal for you, not her, naturally. They can even walk into your pipe bomb throw if you weren't careful enough with your throw and didn't account for one being in the area still. Did you hit her? Did I get her? Did you kill her? No, you no. didn't! Get her, get her, get her, get her, get her! Their aggro range is way too small, though, which makes them really easy to avoid or crown compared to the sitting variation. Plus, they won't even react right away once you enter their zone. But still, I think they're a nice addition. I think the Wandering Witches at their best just goes to show that I'm on the money about the car alarm thing. A slightly random potential hiccup can produce a fun, intense gameplay experience. Speaking of the car alarms, that was one of the improvements made to the AI director and variation allowance in the programming. Before, a car alarm car was always present in the exact same spot. It was an eternal constant. Now, we can pick one of a few places to put the car alarm car. Even more, we're in the first game, the pills, throwables, and guns occupied one of a few set spawn points. In Left 4 Dead 2, there's even more room for switch-ups. Basically, before, healing items like pills either would or wouldn't spawn in a few specific locations in the level. If the game didn't place them, it would be empty. There's no way tier 2 guns or something would ever find their way to that spot instead. This time, they changed the code, allowing the game to place whichever type of item, throwable, healing, or weapon, in the majority of the potential spawning spaces, of which there are many more overall, it seems. There are definitely exceptions, such as certain areas in a specific chapter not allowing any primary gun to get picked, the M60, grenade launcher, and chainsaws having their own set locations, and I've even seen adrenaline shots get prioritized in the back of the truck during the Parish Bridge finale. More often, though, the change to the code is very noticeable. You'll find many weapons in spaces that otherwise might have only been used for pills and grenades if it were built like the first game. Because guns can now appear more often and in more spread out locations, it kind of ruins the call out your survivors will do for weapons. Oh, you see a random tier 1 shotgun? A frying pan? 
Why not tell everyone about it? Web is over here. Oh look guys, a fire axe! The eighth one we've seen in the last two minutes! Weapons over here! It gets on your nerves after a while, especially when going back and playing with the original survivors. It felt like Francis saying, Weapons over here! was supposed to alert everyone in the party that tier 2 guns were found, or at the very least that weapons were scarce enough that missing out would be a problem. Weapons here! Now it's just constant. Weapons over here! We got weapons over here! Weapons over here! Bunch of guns over here! We got weapons over here! I'd also say that, again, at its worst, the randomness results in way too many weapons being thrown your way, including a potential crap load of tier 2 guns. Funny enough, this was a criticism I levied in the previous video without even realizing what the root cause was, the new spawning changes. The game works against itself sometimes, with its unrestricted randomness in most scenarios, but it's both a pro and a con, since it also has the capacity to make campaigns even more replayable. On that note, they also tried to let the game choose the level layout in a few specific chapters. The developer commentary pointed out the one in the Paris Cemetery section, where fences might show up to block more direct paths, but it doesn't seem like there are other big examples of that happening. They wanted to do a similar thing in the park in the same campaign, but playtesters found it too confusing, sadly. Dead Center has multiple ways the alarm in the mall has to be tripped, which is really neat, and I'm pretty sure the mall layout itself can change a bit, but I'm not 100% sure on that, it all kind of blurs together even though i played it many times. The cars with alarms in them can be different, like I've mentioned, and then the weather effects in Hard Rain, both of which I wouldn't really count as the same thing as an ever-changing map layout. I certainly like the idea, but it's a shame there aren't more concrete instances of it happening in the campaigns. The more I learn of Left 4 Dead 2, the more I think a Left 4 Dead 3 could have been fucking awesome. Even with this one follow-up, they upgraded a lot of stuff relating to the director, and I suspect, if given another crack at it, they could have followed through with this dynamic map idea and went even further with the level of variety found in these campaigns. They already did a fantastic job when compared to the original game in that regard, and one of the key elements is the addition of even more unique enemies. There's what the designers call uncommon... <laughs> There's what the designers call uncommon common infected, whose threat level isn't on par to the special types by any means, but still have a strength that makes them a little trickier to deal with. All five are mostly exclusive to their respective campaigns, and also serve to sort of represent the length of time since the initial outbreak. The fireproof CETA zombies show the government's naive handling of the infection spread early on, and in the atrium finale at the mall, the fireproof gimmick carries over to Jimmy Gibbs Jr., which is just plain funny. Basically, this limits Molotovs and fire bullets from being effective, but it's also the only place where fire is regularly a hazard in the opening chapter, so their placement makes a lot of sense. The fallen survivors, which are zombies that have items on them and run away from you, show up in the passing, hinting at the idea that there were survivors holding out on their own not too long ago. This isn't one of the base 5 campaigns, but even still. The clown zombies in the Dark Carnival don't say much about the lore specifically, but they are hilarious. They make squeaky noises when they walk, and can bring a small group of zombies rushing towards you. The Mud Men in Swamp Fever feel like something that couldn't have existed right off the bat. These are the product of enough time passing for the zombies to become one with their environment. They spring up from the water, obscuring your vision when they smack you, and have a creepy running animation. The construction worker infected, the ones with the earmuffs, don't get affected by pipe bombs. I'm not sure if this has a deeper meaning regarding the outbreak timeline, but it's a trait that's endearing at the very least. They'll keep coming after you even when a pipe bomb is beeping and attracting everyone else. Sadly, they're also immune to the boomer bile bombs, meaning Valve likely messed up and coated them to have a blanket resistance to all of the zombie luring throwables. Probably easier that way, but it is a bit unfortunate. Finally, the armored former soldiers, who are impervious from gunfire from the front. A melee shove into a shot to their vulnerable backside works effectively enough. These represent the last stages of government intervention, where they realized how severe this was and started to send the military. That's also the canonical reason the devs gave for some of the more militarized guns showing up in the sequel. The camouflage to the burst rifle was meant to show the US government turning their attention away from the war in the Middle East to the domestic threat back at home. I really like all of these uncommon infected types, especially the clown, their squeaky noises are a delight, and they're a small part of why I adore the campaigns in Left 4 Dead 2. As much as I love the original Left 4 Dead levels, and appreciate what others in the community have created, every official campaign post Left 4 Dead 1 has been a special kind of great. The Sacrifice already had some fun quirks to it, with the tank and the train segment, and the finale had you turn on three separate generators, then go back from the safety of the bridge to sacrifice one person to save the others. 
I do think it's really short, though, as is The Passing, the sequel to it, but if played back-to-back, -back, they feel like a full-length campaign, so that's what I recommend. The Passing itself has its own share of flavor found within. There's the Fallen Survivor zombie, the lootable chests of supplies found in a few spots, the wedding venue with the Bride Witch, and at the end, you get the help of the original survivors as you fill up the generators with gas. Because it was released after the main game as extra, or DLC content, it is easy to spot the similarities between a few other campaigns, though. The first chapter starts you off with only a melee option or pistols, and you're unlikely to find real guns for quite some time, much like a level I'll talk about soon, and there's a chance of seeing Stormy Weather, a hard rain staple. Kind of feels like a mashing of some ideas here, and the finale exemplifies that approach. It's quite literally the exact same map as The Sacrifice, but with the dead center finale gimmick of gathering gas cans. I don't think this is a bad set of levels by any means, but in terms of original content, it does feel a bit lacking. The storyline is also a bit questionable. Not that it had to be amazing or anything, but the premise sticks out. In one sense, yeah, this slotting in the middle of Dead Center and Dark Carnival works well. We have the car and need to cross the bridge, sure. But the Left 4 Dead 1 survivors being here, though? I get that this bridge is where we last saw Zoe, Lewis, and Francis. But what, these three are just going to live on this bridge forever? Oh, sorry, my bad. Lewis's leg is hurt, and Francis hates the military, right. Yeah, now it all makes sense. Also, why not? Have Zoe retell this interaction like Ellis does with his stories about Keith, sure. Dead Center is the real first campaign, and it kicks everything off with an incredible series of levels. Here's everything that's new or unique about it. The hotel setting, the fire and smoke effects, some of which force you to go a different way, like across the ledges on the outside of the building, and the fire can even burst through the doors that have smoke coming out of them, blocking another path. The Sita fireproof zombies are here, we have the distinct objective of bringing the cola to the gun shop owner, the mall setting is new, and has a few ways it can change, like the door or the broken windows triggering the alarm, and the finale is the only one of the core five in the base game that has the objective of you collecting gas cans. It's essentially an upgraded version of the Cola Retrieval, and not only did it become its own game mode called Scavenge, it shows up in The Passing and a ton of other community campaigns, since it's such a good climax. Besides being new or different, there's a few more specifics about Dead Center that are really cool. The hotel starts you off with either a melee weapon or pistols, and you have to make it all the way to the bottom of the elevator to finally be rewarded with a Tier 1 primary gun, such as the SMG once the elevator opens up, or the pump shotgun in the side room. The visual for the area holds up to this day, the smoke dampening your vision, the fire all over, and the zombies rushing in and setting themselves ablaze. It's a great moment, the bottom of the hotel all the way to the safe room. The feeling of finally finding and grabbing that SMG, only to turn it on the now incoming zombies, is amazing, and it kinda makes me yearn for more of this idea. They definitely had to have special coded this level to not drop a weapon in the higher floors of the hotel, and it was well worth the trouble. The Cola objective is very interesting, specifically because of the intentions behind it. In the developer commentary, they mentioned wanting to create an event that would force players to split up, but playtesters didn't like it, so this was their workaround. It was invisible encouragement to work in sets of two. Two grab the Cola, and two use the high ground to cover the others. I gave that strategy a shot, on advanced even, and yeah, it works out really well. It was a cakewalk for the teammate who had the Cola. Just overall a fantastic campaign. My only gripe is that it's four chapters instead of five, because I want more of it. Dark Carnival features the clown zombies, has a lot of striking locales that fit the theme, such as the fairgrounds, potato sack big slide, bumper cars, tunnel of love, the maintenance tunnel of love, and so on. The motel before the carnival is also a great little area, providing a nice contrast to the very vertical hotel of the last campaign. In the fairground setting, along with it being fun to look at, with many peanut standees to smack, I do not like that little peanut guy. How can you not like little peanut? There's even a few intact games to play here. I mentioned the test of strength, but you can do the shooting gallery game and unlock a gnome friend with enough points, and there's whack-a-mole too. These inclusions are just plain fun. They go really well with the idea that four players will be exploring these levels, and one or two might get distracted playing a mini game while others fight off zombies. I know a certain guy named Dave who was pretty fed up with my whack-a-mole playing ways. Oh, he's dorks playing the fucking game again. I didn't, I didn't know! I didn't Even when you aren't pissing your teammates off, the special infected are sure to take advantage of your tunnel vision, nabbing and riding you any chance they get. Wait. Sure, you could argue these are more on the sillier side of things, but I think one tongue-in-cheek campaign is fine, especially if we view them as their own standalone horror film. This particular horror movie happens to lean a little more into the campy vibe, and that's fun. There's even an external side goal found in this campaign of rescuing Noam Chomsky. After you get enough points and reveal the Garden Gnome Prize in Chapter 2, 
If you manage to bring him all the way to the rescue helicopter at the end, you'll get an achievement. What a riot. There's a panic event later on where you'll basically ride a roller coaster, and it's one of the harder panic events in the game, I will add. And the ending is in a concert venue. You'll have to start up a rock show to get the attention of the rescue chopper, and you can even utilize the fireworks and stage ballyhoo to light enemies on fire. Even in the finale, one that's reminiscent of the usual hold out until helicopter arrives stuff in the first game, there's a lot here to separate it from the rest. Swamp Fever has the Mudman enemies and lots of swamp water that slows you down. But if I'm being totally honest, this is the least interesting campaign by a mile. It's confusing to navigate through, which could be a positive for it depending on your point of view, but I'm not a fan. The developer said the water flow is supposed to guide the player in the right direction, which I find pretty unintuitive, and when you're running away from endless zombies, it's not that easy to pop a squat and watch the very small subtleties in the water ripples. The panic events here are ridiculous and silly, which I'll get to later, and the finale is... fine, actually. In fact, the ending chapter is probably my favorite, the big mansion to protect with the turret and zombies climbing all over. Yeah, not bad. Everything else? Not that pleasant. I wouldn't say it's a stinker, but it definitely feels more akin to the basic campaigns found in the first game. Because there are other, far better ones, this one being mid and slapped right in the middle isn't the end of the world. This leads me to Hard Rain, one of the best campaigns in all of Left 4 Dead. This is the only one where you'll retread the same environments again, as the story of the level is that you're here to pick up fuel for the boat, so half the campaign you go towards the gas station, and the other half you're on your way back, but you've already explored this area, and the game takes that into account, as the items you chose to loot remain gone on the return visit. What's more, every chapter the weather changes a little bit, the rain coming down harder and harder, until you've acquired the gas, and then the storm fully breaks out. Torrential downpours will start and stop at seemingly random intervals, blocking your vision, and completely dominating the soundscape, preventing you from hearing when zombies or special infected are nearby, and it even gets so loud it can mask the tank music, causing it to be barely audible. The rain has also caused the areas to flood, so you'll have the choice of going slower through the water on ground level, or keep to the high elevation areas, the places you may have brushed off on the first trip through as unnecessary. My favorite quality to hard rain, however, is in the first half. You start seeing wandering witches now and then, and eventually, you'll come across a couple in the same area. That's never happened before in any other campaign, so it's already kind of spooky, but then there's potential for a huge clump of them when in the sugar mill itself, and afterwards, when crossing the field of crops, there's a good five or so all walking around in here, hidden from sight. Zombies and special infected can charge in, making not hitting one a serious gamble, so much so it's an achievement to get to the safe room without triggering one all chapter, and it's not that common for players to have it. It's also easy to get lost if you don't stick to the pipe in the middle of the zone, both when making your way through the tail end of the witch's den, and also when on the return trip, with the monsoon going nuts. Out of all the official campaigns in both Left 4 Dead games, this one stands out among the bunch, a truly unforgettable journey, but it being so distinct is actually a double-edged sword. In the developer commentary, they talked about their dynamic weather effects, and they made it sound like it was a thing the director could do whenever, except besides the first chapter of The Passing, when it could happen sometimes and other times not, you'll only see the dynamic weather when it comes to the storms in the second half of the Hard Rain campaign, it absolutely gives it its own feel, along with retreading the same areas once more, which have less loot depending on what you grabbed the first time through, the wandering witch's nest, and encouraging that you take a slightly different, higher elevation route because of all the flooding, but because all of these tricks are so great, all of them being jam-packed into a single campaign, it feels like they're being underutilized. I was going to say that this is the opposite of Left 4 Dead 1, since it isn't efficient at all, these ideas only being used for a single series of levels, However, the more I think about it, maybe this is similar to the opening of Dead Center. A touch of handcraftedness does wonders when surrounded by the director's randomness. Finally, there's The Parish, and it's a mix of extremely high highs and mundanely average lows. The Mardi Gras theme and city streets aren't really my cup of tea. It's easy to get turned around in a few spots, specifically the road that you're meant to go down all the way into this door near the turned over bus. I really don't think the level design conveys that this is the right way to go. It doesn't help that the lighting can't be a signal, since everything is dull and bright. I really, really hate the lighting in this campaign. It was wild to hear that this was the first few levels they began creating for Left 4 Dead 2, with the interiors of the restaurants and such. Jeez, kinda underwhelming for most of it. Thankfully, there's a few gimmicks that completely make up for it. 
the car alarm nest, where you enter a surprisingly dark sewer and pop your head out and see a mountain of alarmed cars, is amazing. Getting through this without triggering anything is surprisingly tough with multiple people, especially considering that simply climbing on top of a car sets it off. Oh shit! Oh shit, oh, if, you, if, you, if you go on top of it, it... Oh shit. Yeah, if you step on it. Wow. Alright, looks like you, you hit the alarms. Yeah, However, I all these that, zombies huh? are just climbing out of the fucking ladder, so it's like, easy pickings. This is ridiculous. All the zombies came from this direction, which made it incredibly easy. <laughs> I, I think I'm gonna have to put a thing in the video about how how ridiculous it is when, when zombies climb up and down ladders, because it's just like, it's just so stupid. <laughs> the armored zombies are a fine, uncommon infected. I like the gauntlet crescendo event where you'll need to run around the fences to turn off the alarm. And there's even an event that doesn't feature the new way of running to turn something off, moving the parade float and waiting for it to become a platform. The graveyard having potentially different open pathways for each playthrough is awesome, but like I said, it would have been nice for that to show up in more maps than just this, essentially. The finale, where you'll need to run across the bridge, is incredibly intense. I think this starts to veer into a problem I'll talk about soon when it comes to the difficulty of the game as a whole, but ignoring that for now, going up and down the double-decker bridge, fighting off waves of zombies, and taking on a tank or two feels great. All five of the base campaigns, while mostly lacking in that horror atmosphere the first games had, feature so many unique qualities. I'm sure there are other videos out there ranking them in a tier list or going through them more in depth, but I just love how they all feel really separate from each other while keeping that same loose but connected narrative. Trying to get to New Orleans for evac, starting at the mall, driving the car until they couldn't, taking the helicopter until the pilot became a zombie, riding on the boat until they needed fuel, then hopping aboard again until they got to the final evac zone. Something else that's a huge plus is that, yes, all of these gimmicks and tricks make each individual campaign stand out, but they also add to the pool of shared resources for the community to utilize. Many workshop maps feature some of these elements, and I'd have to imagine Valve took that into account when thinking up these many fun scenarios. Except Swamp Fever, fuck that one. There's two more quasi-official campaigns, but there's not much to say. The Last Stand is an itty-bitty level slapped in front of the Left 4 Dead 1 Lighthouse survival map. Oh boy, a two-chapter campaign, sweet. The first chapter has a very drawn-out crescendo event, turning on the generators and then waiting for the crane to do its thing, and... Yeah, it's not amazing. The finale is just the Lighthouse survival level, but you have to get gas cans at one point, then you go to the boat near the shore for rescue after two tanks. Eh, whatever. Cold Stream is official now, but was actually a fan-created campaign that Valve thought was so good they made it part of the base game. I don't think it's irredeemably bad or anything, but when they pick one community map over the others to make official, it's going to be held to a higher standard, and I'd say... it's okay, I guess. Chapter 2 is by far the most interesting. You exit a tunnel and get this crazy bright sun shining in your face, which is unique. The tank emerging later on, disrupting humongous boulders that instantly knock you down when they make contact, is quite something. And the crescendo event leading to the safe house is absolute madness. Endless, endless zombies pouring in. Meanwhile, you have to fight against the current in some spots, and travel down this extremely cramped stairwell, seemingly custom-built for spitter ambushes. It's insane. This is basically the only time I concluded that the ammo pile that was placed before this section was deserved, since this stretch is so long and arduous. Because it's so difficult, we ended up moving down to normal after a few attempts, which is something I'll talk about in more detail soon, so keep this in mind, but even still, it's a memorable moment for sure. There's a few other bright spots, but overall, this campaign feels... fine. They reused the mud men and armored zombies here. I don't like forest settings in the first place a lot of the time, so the first chapter feels kind of boring especially, and it's only four chapters, the last of which being an endless crescendo event. I'm fine with it existing, but the fact that this was paid DLC for the Xbox version is ridiculous. Along with making a community map made official, this DLC allowed Xbox users to play any mutation they wanted, in addition to adding in the four campaigns from the first game, playable in Left 4 Dead 2. Jesus, imagine paying for this as a separate DLC. Once again, fuck off, Microsoft. Before moving on, there's something to note about the general gameplay of all the campaigns in Left 4 Dead 2, and that's how they modified the Crescendo events. The developers talked about wanting to curtail players just hiding in a corner during these onslaughts, which is why they added the gauntlets to the game, where you'll need to press a button or pull a lever, then run, run, run through the horde, fighting to stay alive, until you find the off switch or get where you need to go. 
I can understand the desire to encourage a playstyle that isn't turtling up and playing it safe, but because you'll have to get to a new location before the zombies stop swarming, it spikes the difficulty tremendously. I mentioned in the first video that I appreciated that these moments were made more challenging, since normal felt a bit harder, however, I didn't foresee the knock-on effect it would have, making higher difficulty selections that much less approachable. The gameplay of everything in between on Advanced feels great, I love and prefer it, but the moment these gauntlets begin, it's as if the game changed which setting we were on. Death after death after death, zombies pour in from all over, the horde will not stop coming until you do the thing. Even then it's not over, after you prove yourself and have gotten to the destination or turned off the noise, there's a persistent trickle of zombie groups that are, I guess, okay with being fashionably late. I've seen zombies spawn and ambush us from within the safe room itself. It's honestly really cool and hectic when you succeed, but the level of chaos is on an entirely different level, to the point where you may feel the need to turn it down a difficulty mid-campaign. I've had to do that in a few separate instances, and I'm happy the game lets you do it, but the problem is, there's not really a fear of dying when running around the level not in a panic event after you swallow your pride and lower the setting. This isn't a you're not good enough and or you're on the wrong difficulty setting problem, it's a there's no ideal difficulty issue, since the two sides of the game, crescendo and non-crescendo, feel wholly divorced from one another, the disparity in the gameplay is staggering. Even worse, since many of them are close to the ends of the chapter, meaning if you are trying to tough it out on a higher difficulty than you probably should, depending on who's with you and what mods you have on for the bots to behave properly. Wait, are you you're still grabbed? Yeah, yeah, yeah. God yeah. damn it, where? Oh, they're so inept when it comes to smokers, dude. Fucking, they can't handle smokers ever, I swear. Smoker! The bitch is choking me! Does it hurt? You'll have to play the level again, even though you were basically right at the finish line. I know this is a lot of bitching about something that'll always come down to preference and skill level, but it was hard not to notice a big shift whenever one of these would spring up. I'd have to imagine a lot of this came down to the melee weapons, or at least the idea of not camping in one spot for a crescendo event. Like the spitter, the gauntlets have to exist to keep the melee weapons less overpowered. As far as the believability of it all, I was originally going to raise a fuss about how silly it is that zombies endlessly pour in after every minor noise our survivors cause with the bottleneck crescendo events. However, when taking a step back, most of them make enough sense, or are at least similar enough to the first games that it wouldn't make much sense to critique them. Sure, the waves of infected never stopping is sillier than them only coming for a brief time window, but before, the noise was something that stopped after a while, or was a discreet sound in the first place. Here, the noises keep on going, like the roller coaster ride, or the merry-go-round, or best of all, the security alarm in the mall. So the prolonged hordes of zombies coincides with the extended disturbance. It works well enough, not a huge deal. However, there's one exception, and it's what I alluded to earlier. Swamp Fever's gauntlets are incredibly dumb. Why would we even need to lower this fucking plank of wood? Is this a bit? It's so stupid it's supposed to be funny, or what? This squeaky lever is such a disruptive noise that it attracts hordes of infected for minutes on end? I didn't want to do this, since it's left for dead, who cares, but we've been trekking through knee-deep water, aimlessly wandering to the next place the whole campaign, and now, suddenly, this little walkway, this five-foot slab of lumber is vital to keep on going? The same can be said for the airplane. Oh, sorry, can't walk around it for some reason, nor can you go through these gaps in the plane itself. No can do, buddy, my guy, my friend. This emergency door is the only way out of this swamp. As far as the characters in Left 4 Dead 2, I've already alluded to it, but I'm not a huge fan. I don't hate them, but I don't love them either. Ellis and his rambly stories are kind of funny, but move the needle of the tone towards the less serious side quite a bit. Coach's nostalgic love for old rock bands and his church-going ways and... Whatever else he's known for, I don't know, calling witches bitches all the time. Bitches must like sugar. I've spent more time in Left 4 Dead 2 than I have with 1 at this point, and none of them have really won me over in that extended length of time. In fact, the moment I went back to play a campaign that featured the original group of survivors, I instantly became more comfortable. It was like returning home after a long day at work. I got to mentally relax and enjoy whenever these personalities decided to interact with one another. The only interactions I genuinely enjoyed with the new group were the start of Swamp Fever, where Nick defends his decision to shoot the zombie pilot. Nick, what the hell? You shot the pilot. Well, he wasn't doing a very good job once he became a zombie, not was he? True, true, he was a zombie, but he was also our only pilot. I shot a zombie. 
He was a zombie, Ellis. He must have gotten bitten before he picked us up. Nick, what the hell? You shot the pilot. Well, he wasn't doing a very good job once he became a zombie, Don, was he? That's true. If I had to pick a low point in the flight, it was probably when he stopped flying the chopper and attacked us. The time where Ellis started telling us a story about us by accident and didn't realize it until he was nearly done. Keith and I were on the top of a burning building and we had to fight our way down like five floors of zombie. It... Wait a second. I guess that was you guys. And Nick and Rochelle talking about getting his suit dirty. I ruined my white suit. <laughs> the white suit with zombie brains all over it? That one? Brains come out. Swamp water doesn't. Don't ask me how I know that. Besides that, I like when they talk amongst themselves about what Special Infector called early on, them saying things like, huh, so that's a tank, and such. Rochelle's demeanor towards Ellis is kind of sweet. Nick's bloodthirsty screams when he's using the chainsaw are always hysterical. Yeah, and that's kind of it. There's just not enough here to make them anything more than passable, and even worse, one character in particular actively went out of his way to cause me to dislike him. This is gonna break a lot of hearts, but it's Coach. If you pay attention, you'll notice it too. He says the same line with the same inflection so goddamn often, it makes me want to find a mod to completely remove that voice line from the game. Seriously, next time you play, I want you to listen in for when he says this, Watch out! Watch out! or this. Look out! Look out! All of the survivors this time around say look out or watch out far too often. Hey, watch watch out! Out! But Coaches is the only one that consistently breaks through whatever noise is currently sounding off. His distinct voice cuts through everything else to reach your ears each and every time. Oh shit! Watch out! An entirely new game mode sprung from the gimmick of one of the campaign finales. Scavenge mode is simply the goal of filling up the car with gas, but that's all you do, usually with generators instead. Two teams of four, and much like with Versus, one team plays as the zombies, one as the survivors, and they go back and forth. There's a lot of maps to pick from, and they seem to have a certain amount of gas cans placed in set areas. Because it's a best of series, usually three, and all that matters is if you win the round versus racking up a bunch of points, the second team to play as the survivors in a round just has to collect one more gas can than the previous team did to get a win, and it's a best of something, usually three, so the team who gets to two wins first wins the whole match. The tiebreaker being how fast you collected all of them works really well, and creates some extremely tense moments when looking at the results screen. This works both when you have two really good teams who've collected all of the gas cans in the map, and when you're both kind of shit and have happened to land at a specific number, like 10. Regardless if you're garbage or a literal let for dead god, it's a decent time, as long as people don't take it too seriously, but sadly this is a 14 year old game, so the majority of the people in online lobbies are veterans, and thus most seem to take it very seriously. There's a surprising amount of nuance to this game mode which makes it really interesting. Every gas can successfully poured into the generator extends your time to collect. When the timer runs out, or all survivors are incapacitated, the round is over. On smaller maps, the timer is almost never an issue, but on larger ones, yeah, that can play a role. When the clock hits zero, if a survivor is currently holding on to a gas can, you're in a grace period, like the final play of a football game, or the ball being in the air at the end of a basketball game. Sports, am I right? Yeah! Except here, if the player manages to return the gas can successfully, more time gets added, 20 seconds I think, and you play on, so those moments where it comes down to a single player attempting to dump their gas can, Holy crap, those are butt-clenching. White outline gas cans are ones that haven't been touched by the survivors, but when they're outlined in orange, it means they have been picked up and are, essentially, in play. This matters if you're a spitter on the opposing team, since orange outlined gas cans you can destroy with your acid spit. It's not instantaneous, you'll see the can flashing for a second or two before it explodes into fire, so you do have a chance to make a quick save, which can be exhilarating when you nab it right before it's too late, but if you left all your gas cans in the same spot and one of them goes in flames, they likely all will, which is brutal. Destroyed gas cans will reset at their respective spawning points again, so if all of them go at once, that's a huge blow to the survivors. There's also the risk of shooting them yourself by accident, another tactic for zombie players to keep in their back pocket. Maybe charging in and getting them to fire at you, hoping they miss, will result in them screwing their team out of a gas can. All of these little small but significant subtleties make this game mode feel wholly distinct, while also providing that same Left 4 Dead versus magic at the same time. When a match comes down to the wire, oh baby can those final moments of win or lose gameplay feel exciting and intense.
In terms of strategy, it certainly seems that creating a human conveyor belt, where you simply toss them from person to person in a line, having one or two people finding and tossing, and the other one or two filling the generator up, is the way to go. The pro players are quite impressive with their E button spamming and their throwing skills, they can juggle like four at a time, but I'm not sure if the meta behind Scavenge looks as interesting as just playing the game casually. I can easily see how this would have been a joy to play back when everyone was trying out the game for the first time, but the moment certain people with more time on their hands develop their skills, the lack of a skill-based matchmaking just invites the toxic behavior that's just not fun for me personally. It's especially unfortunate, since this seems like such a perfect drop-in, drop-out mode, one where there shouldn't be a ton of pressure. There's a lot less commitment opposed to playing a campaign on co-op or versus, so it's a shame some of the community are fickle about which maps are picked, or quit out if they have a teammate that even makes a small mistake. This brings me to No Mercy Rooftops. Talk about optimizing the fun out of a game, the hardcore fanbase of this mode seems to want one map and one map only, Rooftops. On one hand, it is very interesting. It's the only map that I'm aware of that has bottomless pits you can utilize as Special Infected. Using a jockey to pull them off, or a charger to barrel them off the ledge, on paper, is awesome. However, the reason this map gets picked so much is, although it does contain a lot of gas cans, since the stage itself is so tiny, those cans are all extremely close to the generator. This does a few things. Not only can veteran players move efficiently and swiftly to show off their stuff, it also means the survivors are generally always pretty close to each other, so a special infected can't really do much without being in the vision of a different survivor. Your only bats are near the gas cans at the exterior of the map, but even still, beyond a fluke or something, the pro players will yeet those cans up and move on without issue. When you encounter enough veterans in one squad, the question won't be, can they get all of the cans, but how fast can they go? It's practically a foregone conclusion that all 21 cans will be retrieved. It's definitely the map the community have chosen as their skills showcase battlegrounds, but fucking hell, it's so boring and optimized, there's barely any stakes, and the special infected have almost no room to stretch their legs, besides those outer areas, like I said. It's not fun, I'm sorry. I'm just happy I was able to inject some variety into the lobbies I was hosting, selecting stages that don't seem to get picked as much. I've even seen a Not No Mercy in chat before, so I can tell I'm not the only one who thinks this map gets played too often. If I had to guess, though, in addition to No Mercy Rooftops, Port is likely another favorite for regular players, given that newbies will want to select it for the achievement of playing on it five times. Thankfully, it's good enough to earn its reuse. This is one of the better maps for scavenge, in my opinion. It's big enough to separate a group, has enough houses and walls to block the survivor's vision, and there's even a high-up vantage point near the generator for the spitter to hang out. Because it's become the tried-and-true spitter nest, it does get a bit tired and predictable after enough time, but conceptually, it's a really good addition. Having a bird's-eye view as a spitter is quite fitting, given that their initial visual concept design was being a bird lady, essentially, before turning into what they have now. They thought it was verging on too goofy, so they switched it, but we can still hear the shrieks and caws from the sound design. The height is also beneficial since you can splatter the generator spot with spit really easily, resulting in some damage and some gas cans being destroyed. That does lead me to one annoying idiosyncrasy of this game mode in relation to points, however. It doesn't matter a whole lot, the points on the zombie side of things aren't what wins you the round, but when defending yourself from being kicked, it's good to have a respectable score to show that you have been helping your team. That said, to me, the fact that destroying gas cans as a spitter doesn't net you any points on its own is really silly. That's literally one of the most beneficial things you can do when as a spitter, especially when the gas cans are close to the generator and they have to respawn far away. I was thinking even a flat 25 points per destroyed can could work, but perhaps you could do it by distance, so a ruined can further away from its own spawn point would earn more than one you destroyed near where the survivors grabbed it. I don't know, something to show the other players that yes, you're clearly helping the team. I also think it's interesting how coveted the spitter is in Scavenge, given they interact with the gas cans in a way the others don't. Everyone wants the opportunity to light up the opponent's dreams ablaze, but I'd have to imagine most people wouldn't like spawning as the boomer in this mode. It's the same as versus survival. The horde is coming all the time anyway, the players are in this set area regardless, so their biggest gimmick, luring zombies towards the survivors, is dampened quite a bit. At the very least, they do blind human players, which might help in a non-direct way, I guess, and when they explode, the orange outline gas cans nearby can be blown away or in the air. I suppose this tactic could work on rooftops, but I've already gone over why the special infected don't get much time or room to do much there, so it's a moot point. Port being such a balanced map raises another point about this game mode. Some maps are brand new for the idea, such as Death Toll, Dark Carnival, Swamp Fever, and so on, 
but others aren't. Both Port and the Passing and the Atrium and Dead Center are the same as they are in their respective campaigns, meaning the designers likely spent more effort here than in others, balancing and thinking about how to craft a satisfying gas can retrieval process for the survivors, and shape the environment to give the versus mode special infected a way to slow the survivors down. Perhaps this is why Atrium feels as streamlined as rooftops at times. Everyone knows the best strategy, toss them all down and fill her up, but at least here, there's more room to work with as a zombie, given the vertical nature and loss of visuals on each survivor from the ground floor. The survival mode is back, and this time you can play it in a versus mode setting. The versus variation of it is actually really boring to me though. Playing as the special infected is normally a good time, so this was surprising, until I pinpointed what the cause was. In the other game modes, sure, killing the survivors is the goal, but you're also trying to stop them from doing something else, be it collecting gas cans or simply traveling to the safe room. Because the objective for the survivors is to literally just stay alive in one confined map as long as possible, there is less room to catch a player by surprise, or to plan ahead based on where you know the survivor has to eventually end up. You lump in with the horde, endlessly throwing yourselves at the other team, essentially just having a deathmatch of sorts, which just isn't that appealing to me. It also doesn't help that the rounds can be on the shorter side, sometimes ending abruptly and anticlimactically, usually because human players are obviously better than the AI in most cases. This means you might only get two or three spawns as a special infected. The pacing just feels really off for me, I'll stick to the other game modes. Speaking of that, I spent a lot more time playing the non-versus survival this time around with Discord peoples, and I have to admit, it can be an absolute blast when you have a group. The fact that there's this many levels to pick from is pretty crazy, and some really stand out, like Death Toll's sewers and church, Crash Course's truck depot, and the passing's wedding venue. The chaos and intensity ramping up as fast as it does makes each round fly by, and in the best way possible. There's no wasted time here, there aren't a few pathetic and worthless rounds thrown in at the start to pad out the player's time. Ten minutes is exceedingly well done, and you might be struggling just to get to four. Surprisingly, this approach of bite-sized mayhem adds to its charm, since you could easily find yourself retrying the same fun map over and over again, not realizing that an hour had already gone by. Whoops. The many, many mutations available in the base game, which modify the experience in some way, are fun for what they are, but I can't say I was drawn to many of them. I liked the survival mutation Nightmare that adds a fog effect, among some beefier enemies. I downloaded the Steam Workshop fog effect to test out, since I like the Nightmare mutation so much, but the one I tried was too strict, and the linearity of the campaign makes it a bit worse. It being active in a survival setting works really well. Special delivery is nuts, there's zero common infected, and special spawn all the freaking time. Like many things here, maybe this is fun with friends for a round or two, and some groups could get really into it and make it their gimmick challenge run, but it certainly isn't appealing to me, to say the least. The one I liked the most, out of all of them that I tried, was Last Man on Earth, a solo-centric mutation where there aren't any common infected, like special delivery, but unlike there, they spawn far less frequently. Getting grabbed means you essentially lose a life. You don't get downed, since nobody could pick you up, of course, and instead of dying, you fall to a low health, and the next grab will kill you. This means you have to use a medkit before another special infected manages to pin you down, otherwise you're actually for realsies dead. The novelty of this one was worth at least a playthrough, I dug the vibes of it a lot. It was eerie seeing this setting so devoid of, well, anything, living or undead. Very cool. I've already touched on realism mode a bit, but it essentially strips the game of any non-diegetic visuals, removes rescue closets, and makes the witches more punishing when on normal difficulty or higher. Getting hit by a witch is instant death instead of getting downed, and is why I mentioned that defibrillators can be especially useful here. Plus the fact that rescue closets aren't a thing, they need to be revived or you'll have to make it to the safe room without them. The main reason realism mode is much more difficult comes down to the lack of outlines around the characters. Not being able to see where your allies are when behind walls is way, way more significant than you might think at first blush. You basically have to stay within eyesight and announce to your party any time you're entering a different room or climbing a ladder. When a special infected has a teammate pinned down, well, let's hope you can find them, you don't have any cues to go on. It's crazy. I bet a lot of people had a blast with this, either playing it seriously or just for shits and giggles. As far as the community campaigns go, there are a lot of them, like... A crap load, seriously, way too many to even begin scratching at the surface of covering a large percentage of them. Much like last time, I'll cover three in this video as a nice wrap-up on Left 4 Dead 2. Before that, though, I want to give a blanket approval to all of the slightly altered original campaigns, the ones where it's a new take on a classic Valve map. Holy hell, I loved these. No Mercy Rehab, especially. Like, 
No Mercy is one of the best campaigns from the first game by far, and it was such a joy to walk around this reimagining of it, trying to figure out the environment again. It gave me the sensation that I was playing a remake, kind of like the Resident Evils, or at the very least, like a second scenario or something. Just, man, I thought these would be some of my least favorite, but they ended up being almost the opposite. There were times where I was thinking, wow, this is so awesome yet so simple, maybe a Left 4 Dead 3 AI director could have given us something like this, if we assume Valve were to keep iterating on the dynamic map idea anyway. Okay, now for the real stuff. The community campaigns I'll be reviewing today are Devil Mountain, Death Strip, Urban Flight, and Daybreak. Devil Mountain is, from top to bottom, a solid campaign. I can't say it's my favorite out of the ones I've played, but almost nothing about it is bad either. The chapters all feel distinct, and the settings make you feel like you're really on a journey to get somewhere. You start in a suburban neighborhood, move through a construction area, climb up the side of a mountain, go through caves, and have a finale at the summit. The street level has a nice start. A car comes down and crashes into an alarmed car, summoning the horde immediately. There's a turret here to deal with it, I guess, but it does feel pretty out of place, and if you have AI, they're going to stand right in front of you. The lighting in the house and all around it, including the pool, is visually appealing, and the white functional lights shining on the hills and the construction company behind it are a nice contrast. There's a lot of extra areas to explore all around, be it the backyard and treehouse in Chapter 1, or the many sheds and buildings in Chapter 2. Chapter 3 is where things start to get really interesting, as storms start triggering when you're making your way up the mountain. The heavy rain does a good job of hiding threats on this narrow play space, including witches if you're lucky. The cave section is my favorite part of the campaign. It feels completely original, and plays and looks fantastic. The string lights, the shiny and kind of damp looking floors and walls, and the trails on the ground to help with navigation. During the panic event, the zombies will filter in through the tunnels, and even drop from above in the opening up top. Oh, it's just great, what a good time. The finale area feels just big enough to roam around and use multiple vantage points, there's a turret in two spots, on the roof and on the ground, and the map overall looks lovely. A helicopter at the end will take you away, and yeah, a pretty good campaign. Death Strip, at a glance, looks to be selling something incredible. A comic book-themed campaign? Well, it's nothing earth-shattering, like a different visual filter or anything, but even still, the comic-y sound effects slapped over a few of the noisy environmental objects is really fun. Shooting a TV, using the radio, the sirens from the Crescendo event going off, and my favorite, the car alarms blaring. It's quite charming. This is overall a pretty good campaign, nothing too crazy, but there were some fun gimmicks. You should know how much I love gimmicks at this point. Machete here. There was one area with a buttload of car alarm cars. Cita zombies, boomer bile bombs, and explosive barrels show up a lot more than in any official map, and the most hectic panic event found within Death Strip goes crazy with all three. It's a gauntlet similar to the one found in the parish, and there's bile bombs and explosive barrels found every 10 feet it feels like, plus the Cita zombies rushing in. This has to be encouragement to shoot the barrels and throw the boomer puke into the flames, right? If not, I'm a genius. If so, a very cool idea. This crescendo event genuinely felt unique compared to the majority I've seen in these mod campaigns. I don't know if the writing on the wall for the safe rooms was original or not, but I quite liked what I saw. Two more random fun things to mention. At one point, I had to throw a Molotov at a witch, since she was going to aggro anyway, and no lie, a smoker actually saved me from getting downed by her. Remember me mentioning, way earlier in this video, about the AI tax you have to sometimes pay? It doesn't happen as often when in Left 4 Dead 2 for me, given the Better Bots Workshop add-on, but good lord, in the finale, which is incredibly intense as it is, a tank showed up, and then I get grabbed by a hunter, and nobody does anything. It's like their brain turns off when they see a tank. Literally just shove him off and I'm instantly able to help, but nah, Nick stares at me and hides in the corner for some reason. I thought I'd have to restart for sure, but he somehow managed to pick me up, so I used my adrenaline shot and rushed to the truck. I'll take what I can get, sorry everybody else. This was the mod campaign I chose to talk about for the combination video that wasn't in the standalone Left 4 Dead 2 retrospective. If you have any interest in me going through and reviewing some other mod campaigns, consider signing up to the Patreon. Specifically, I'll be talking about I Hate Mountains 1 and 2, Suicide Blitz 1 and 2, and Back to School. Anyway, that's my pitch. Let's get back to finishing up this video. Urban Flight has a lot going for it, so this will be a longer one. You start with dual pistols and don't find tier 1 guns for quite a while, which is awesome, 
The visuals of the outdoor areas are genuinely stunning, with the orange glow and ash falling all around you, and you can even spot the faraway buildings on fire. The Gnome Depot, as it's called on the truck outside, as well as the bookstores and many other side buildings make this city area come alive. Although the simple fence blocking the path is a bit uninspired, and there are definitely gaps that could fit your body, I like having to go through a building, up a few floors, across to a different building, and down some stairs. This creator knew when to add some verticality to spice things up. There's also this ludicrous fence slide a bit earlier, which seems like far too big of a drop without breaking our legs, but it's funny, so it's worth it. These chapters are a bit on the longer side, but refreshingly, they didn't feel fatiguing. It was a nice challenge, and even better, the second chapter plays on this in a genius way. You get to a safe room door, and when you open it, you see a destroyed safe room. I've played this campaign twice, once where we walked right in, and the other time a tank literally busted down the safe room door in front of us. Incredible, what a moment. Another excellent set piece comes a bit later. We get to the roof and have to blow up this tower, which causes a horde of zombies to rush in. A very nice crescendo event overall, and afterwards you cross over this narrow ladder to the other side. Then you walk down some flimsy-looking wooden stairs, until out of nowhere it breaks and you fall all the way down. Here is where my two playthroughs split in a very fun way. The first time through, I had no idea what was up ahead. We just heard a witch and we made sure to be careful. I could see her in the room to the right, so I suggested we run past. Okay, on through and run. Go, three. Oh, okay. That's right, all these rooms have witches in them, except one, I think. Help me! Help me! What I thought was a safe space to hide out in, post-witch, ran me right into another witch. Even funnier, the hero closet to rescue Rochelle was placed inside the other witch room. This time, the witch got stuck, thankfully, but just my luck, I ended up barging into yet another witch's room across the hall. Man, what a devious area. The visuals for it already match the red color palette of the witch designs well, and the idea of a clump of them in one spot is just fantastic. In my other playthrough, we didn't piss any witches off, but when we fell down the stairs, a spitter was in the exact worst placement and got us when we fell in that tiny area. Good lord. The hotel-turned-makeshift hospital is a surprisingly thorough touch when it comes to the world-building for this campaign. We're still in Chapter 2, by the way, so the relief of finally getting to the safe room at the end of it was immense, a very well-put-together level. Chapter 3 has a great crescendo event near the end, where you'll need to lower the bridge back down, since earlier a car drove through and raised it behind them, interestingly enough. After the bridge is finally down and the gate goes up, you have to run across to turn off the noise. This isn't on par with the end of the Parish campaign or anything, but this bridge section is pretty intense. You may or may not have to leave someone for dead. Wait. The finale has you getting gas cans to fill up the generator to power the hangar, which allows the door to be opened, so we can board the plane that guy who drove over here is trying to pilot. Nothing spectacular, but it's a good finish. This is definitely one of the better campaigns I've played out of all of the community maps across both games. Help me! Help me! That said, though, Daybreak fucking blew me away. The quality of this campaign is unbelievable. If there was ever another community map to add to the base game of Left 4 Dead 2, my vote is on this one a thousand percent. I don't even know how they pulled some of this stuff off, to be honest. It takes place in San Francisco, and they incorporate the Golden Gate Bridge and Alcatraz in phenomenal ways. First off, even before that, the opening chapters already have a few branching paths and side areas, like deciding which way to get out of the sewer, or stopping through a couple completely optional entire buildings. The bridge itself is one of the most impressive things I've seen by any creator. In other campaigns, there have been instances where you slide down a slope, and it's fine, it feels like a return point, as the developers call it, where you have a good vantage point from above, but when you inevitably continue, you can't go back. You're there now. The way Daybreak did theirs, though? Amazing. The bridge collapsed in this area, and you're meant to carefully make your way down, but there are gaps now and then, but you'll need someone to come help you if you fall in. This trek down this one slope was the only one out of any I've seen that actually felt daunting, like you had to seriously watch your step and carefully manage the steepness of the incline. Looking back, when you make it to the cruise ship, seeing the zombies pouring down it was something else. The visuals of this entire campaign were on another level. Beautiful vista after gorgeous view after great attention to detail touches. The pool area with all of the bodies strewn about, the shuffleboard section in the beginning that serves no purpose at all, it's just there after the crescendo event. The first chapter's beach and water with the bridge high above. Just impeccable. 
This campaign also featured a fake safe room of sorts, but not quite as bamboozly as the Urban Flight one. The final chapter, where you're in Alcatraz, was out of this world. This finale is the coolest one I've ever played, hands down. It's the classic scavenge goal. Many gas cans are found within the cells, which you have to open yourself with the lever. Many cells contain zombies ready to pounce at you, like boomers, hunters, and chargers, or a few of them might house items. The level of verticality in this environment is insane. It's easy to get lost and turned around. And what's more, fucking witches can spawn in here, making it even more tense and chaotic. The amount of voice lines found in this campaign that fit right in astounded me. Like, did they dig these up from somewhere or what? I don't remember them ever talking about a prison before, but there were voice lines for it. Man, I don't even think been this bad. Earlier on the bridge, there was a CETA vehicle, one that starts a crescendo event, and Coach acknowledged that he'd seen this before. Oh, damn, another one of these things. This has to be referencing the one found in the parish, right? Which means, hell, Valve could co-sign this campaign as being completely canon if they wanted. I can't believe how good this one was. There were so many unique assets not found in the base game. The setting was used to perfection, especially the bridge, which is looming over a lot of the earlier chapters and is still visible when on the cruise ship. Goddamn, hats off. Just perfection. All that being said, there were a lot of great campaigns I didn't include here, though. This game is very much alive and well if you want it to be, partly due to the near-endless amount of content streaming out of the Steam Workshop. When thinking about an angle for this video, or a phrase for the thumbnail at the very least, initially I was going to go with, Left 4 Dead 2 is timeless, and even though I strayed away from that idea since it seemed too generic and circle jerky, it really is true. This game remains absolutely stellar to this day. The core gameplay, the integrated co-op and multiplayer, the supposed director changing things up, the special infected, hell, even the music. The song that plays at the end of a chapter, and the one that plays once a campaign is almost done and into the credits, those are way catchier than they have any right to be, and are bangers even 14 years on. This game isn't perfect in my eyes, but it stands the test of time in the ways that matter. I've had the pleasure of introducing a few of my online friends to Left 4 Dead 2 when making this video, and even though they're younger, and thus have grown accustomed to other shooters and the more modern ways of designing games, they all said the same thing. Holy shit, this game is fun as fuck when you play it with friends. That might sound natural, almost expected, right? What game isn't better with friends? Well, to me, almost all of them. It seems I'm in the minority where I actually prefer to play games alone, not just multiplayer with randoms, but even with my friends and family. Don't get me wrong, I can still have fun and enjoy the social aspect of it all, and depending on the game, I can definitely have a blast while playing. I am the EDF guy, after all. But for me, the idea that friends always make a game more fun just isn't true. Breath of the Wild, Majora's Mask, Resident Evil, Darkwood, Metroid Prime, Death Stranding, and so many more. None of them would be more enjoyable for me with a friend. And that's why I think it's significant that I agree with the people I've introduced Left 4 Dead to. The game is good, but when playing with friends, it's fucking amazing. The reason is simple. This, more than almost any other game I've played, was designed around the co-op experience. From top to bottom, the game mechanics, items, levels, enemies, and on and on foster teamwork. They encourage playing as a unit, sticking together as a group. Add on the many other pieces of the puzzle that make the games great, such as the structure of the campaigns to be mini-stories all their own while being semi-connected to the overall travels of these survivors, the gimmicks and settings making each one distinct, the AI director behind the scenes altering each playthrough, even if only a little, such as the spawn points of items and the placements of witches and tanks, and the delightful and consistent horror film window dressing, which extends from the sound design to the load screen posters and credits at the end. This is simply a perfect series of games, even if one of them isn't perfect on its own, and it being someone like me saying that, knowing my clear preference in slower-paced, exploration-heavy single-player games, that has to mean something. I was hesitant at the end of the first video when saying this, but I think I've cemented it in my head as time went on. Left 4 Dead is a masterpiece, and it coming from me makes that take all the more significant. To that same effect, Left 4 Dead 2 might not be flawless, the variety and frequency of the item placements can sometimes hurt the experience, but there's no denying it. Left 4 Dead 2 is the ultimate everlasting dragon of a video game. I don't think it'll ever go out of style, it's just as fun and worth playing today as it was 14 years ago, and I suspect in another 14 years, the sentiment will remain. Hey, retro video game reviewer of 2037 or so. Good, right? Yeah, the game is good. 
Thank you for watching this combination video, and you may have already watched the other two, so... Yeah, thanks for watching the videos again, if you are one of those people. Um, hopefully the added mod campaign stuff was worth it. Uh, if not, maybe subscribe to the Patreon, you know, there's me reviewing other mod campaigns there. If that interests you, I don't know. Uh, but subscribe would be nice if you haven't subscribed already, that'd be really helpful for the channel. Um, for the next 10 minutes it'll just be goofy clips of me and other people I played with. Hopefully you find them as funny as I found them. Um, yeah, until next time, I probably won't be doing a video as long as this uh, for a little bit, but who the fuck knows, I am unpredictable. Okay, uh, see ya. Oh, there she is! What? Oh, fuck! You did it! You did it! You did it! Nope, I'm out of here. Why'd you get me? Because she couldn't reach me. <laughs> Do you want more validation? You want me to laugh at it again? You know what, Craig? I'm gonna lash out. Oh. Well, I'm terrified. <laughs> Did you shoot the fucking car? Okay, well... Yes. The save room is literally right here, so... I'm gonna die anyway? Are you oh fucking... Boy, I'm oh gonna boy, die. Oh I got you! you pipe bomb! Oh, the pipe bomb is actually... Yeah, no, I'm gonna die to the pipe bomb now. Oh, sorry. I, I got spit on! Are oh. you fucking serious? <laughs> oh my god. Oh my god, I'm on fire! Dork, this oh, is that your was fault! Me. Yeah, you the, killed the fire was... Your fault, Dork. Yeah, fault. the fire was... The fire was me, actually. Yeah, um... Sorry about you that. fucking annihilated us. You... <laughs> I guess you were right. You lashed out. Oh, I'm up again? Okay, well, I'm gonna get the Why did I die? Why I am I so die? sorry. I am so sorry, Nate. I am so sorry. I am. Why yeah, this is I actually unbelievable. Die? This is unbelievable. Yeah, let's, leave, let's just leave him there. I'm I think. gonna lash out, he said. <laughs> I'm gonna lash out! Stop it, You killed hurts. an innocent person! <laughs> <laughs> you actual psychopath! Oh my god! Don't make me come really? out there for ya! <laughs> Reload! Reloading! Here. Quit screwing around! What Get, inside. Get inside! Get <laughs> inside! Hey, you keep closing it! What are you talking about? <laughs> I kept trying to go in and the door closed. <laughs> Get in here, guys! Damn, Rochelle, nice. We're you weren't closing the door? Uh, no, not at all. <laughs> yeah. Yo, it's Fuck off. Do <laughs> you like that that's a mechanic? Like, you can. Hey. Dip. Drew, come on! I'm just gonna go back up. I'm gonna go back Drew, up. Drew, come on! I, I, open the door! Oh shit, there's a fucking boomer out here, dude. Let me in. <laughs> Holy fuck! <laughs> you dickhead! Oh shit! Dude, look I'm at sorry, that. Smart. And watch all the bodies are gonna flow. Ready, ready, ready? <laughs> Physics! Absolutely humongous brain. It was also exactly how it's meant to be used. What? <laughs> Wait, it was. It was just. You know. Wait, Wait, I'm impressed. Hang Pretty on, hang on, hang on. Are, are, are you saying that you're supposed to use pipe bombs when there's a big group of zombies? I. I'm gonna be honest, I vibe checked them, and that is the Oh my god, case. there's a charger right behind us! <laughs> <laughs> over, Renji, you know, over here, Renji, here comes the real important part, right? The real important part. Yeah, Renji. Oh, the, ex the, the fallback all explosives. Of, no, no, we yeah, have yeah. all of our explosives over here. Don't shoot yeah, in this direction. Shoot yeah, I in heard. this direction. I'm just saying, do <laughs> not shoot towards this area. Good. They're in the church. Oh, They're um, behind us. Next... Someone, oh, shoot. someone oh, shot. No. Who shot? <laughs> I, no, I didn't. Me. It was one. We were all over there. I know I didn't shoot. <laughs> I know I didn't shoot. I'm recording this, so I'll, I'm gonna investigate. <laughs> oh, you should. <laughs> you should. We're good. They're in the church. Oh, They're so... by... We're good. Any publicity in a YouTuber's still. video is good publicity. Yeah, we're, no, we're in a I'm, comedy club, you have to go with it. I refuse to play along, I fucking hate jokes, alright? Don't ever joke with me. I will piss my pants right here. Dude, that would be way- that would make it funnier. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I think- I think hey, I'd have to compliment the commitment. If I do that, could you put that in the video? Well, I, you have to have like a video of yourself doing it, but yeah. Wait, what, what if I just told you I did it? No, that doesn't count. <laughs> I did it. I just did it. Put it in. <laughs> Put this in. 
<laughs> okay, if you give me Dork ten. Dork I just pissed myself. That's great. Hey, everyone. <laughs> hey. That's good. I, oh, I'm being... Do you want to heal me? I would love to. Because these idiots just use their things. Here, Fudge. I am good. Hey, you look a little worse for wear. Let me heal you, bud. Hang on. Come back here. Wow, thanks, Dorkax. This is just like consensual gay sex. <laughs> we did it! Hooray. <laughs> That's fair. Can I just say, I do sure. think that that clip, if you put all the shit we went through before that clip, leading up to that line, it makes that line the funniest thing in the world. To think that you died in that fucking room behind me, and we game overed just so that I could eventually say a line as shit as that, I think it's comedy gold, personally. So we know! God damn it. Did she just... She healed me. The whole... Well, one of the things I wanted to do was to have you heal me. No, I heal oh, you. Right. No, I heal you. And you, and you like, say something funny like, Oh, you gotta buy me dinner, dog axe, or something stupid. Is that your British accent? Uh, I can try better if you want. <clears throat> no, no, don't. I think it's, I think it's great. I think you should go with that. Um... Yeah, I'll, I'll have to get, uh, I'll have to think up my, um, hilarious, uh, I'll think up a hilarious line when I, when I heal you. Uh, uh, do you want me, you want me to get hurt, don't you? I'll just fucking shoot her. Perfect. Okay. And I'll heal you. I'll shoot her and then, like, and then, like, we'll do the, the whole bit. I've got a great line. Oh shit! Oh, you, had, you had you had to not let me die. That oh. wasn't important. Hang on. That oh my god. Oh my god. Step. Hang on. I almost just passed out. Sorry. <laughs> the, the important step of the process was to not let me die there. I, I was so ready with my med kit that I I forgot that the AI are so much. <laughs> it's killing me. I forgot the AI don't know what to do when it comes to seeing a witch. They just stand there. <laughs> Okay. I have one hit point. If if I get touched, I will die. And I, I'm in the closet. I'm in the I know, closet but right I have to use this to heal you. But would it make any sense if I healed you at zero HP? Well, I guess you can't let the AI take the wheel. I was a horde. <laughs> I have a pipe bomb. Don't worry. I have a pipe bomb. Pipe bomb. Pipe bomb. Oh, that's close. Oh, if there you goes. You do this without getting hit. That's quite impressive. And maybe that makes for a. Quick there hit. goes Zoe. Looks like Zoe was also picked up a few times. Do this, do this whole horde without getting hit, and that's a whole different clip. It, it's no longer about critiquing the game. You're like, I'm just putting this clip in because I'm sick. Watch this. <laughs> Watch as I slowly move my camera, point and click, yeah. on the two zombies here. <gasps> that, oh, that was clutch as hell! <laughs> no, you're totally allowed, in the video, you're now totally allowed to be like, right, let's stop critiquing the game for a moment, and let's see a clip of me being really there's good. There's a tank, there's a tank, there's a tank. Oh my god, hang on. I'm gonna door. heal you, I'm gonna heal you, I'm gonna heal you. Say something funny! I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm ready. Heal me, heal me, heal me. Heal me! Oh my god, did you die? Wait, so fudge, hey. fudge, fudge. Round two, round two. Here uh, you go, fudge. Oh, Dorkax, you should have. Thank you. Sure. Let's I had fucking. <laughs> <laughs> I just so wasn't ready. <laughs> uh, you need a bit of healing, my, my dude. Say something funny. <laughs> yeah, and also fucking easy, is it? He's got nothing. <laughs> you didn't give Bro me a was chance. I was dying. Bro is cooking nothing. <laughs> I don't know. I'm going. I'm going with. I'm going out with dignity. Oh, let that's me just... the least dignified thing you just can let me die, bro. <laughs> you look so pathetic right there. No, you're right. You're you right. lost this all is... dignity. <laughs> this has gone the opposite of how I wanted it to. <laughs> oh, this is embarrassing, Lewis. Just let me. <laughs> There we go. <laughs>